So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for being a bit uh, late. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this conference on the future of the European neighborhood policy. And it's a great honor for me to welcome the responsible commissioner, Gio Hahn, here in Vienna. Thank you, Gio, for attending this conference. I just had the opportunity to say it to you, but I would like to say it here publicly uh, again. It was a great pleasure to organize the conference together with Carnegie Europe, and let me therefore particularly welcome Jan Techau and his team uh, from Carnegie Europe. Thank you very much for the opportunity to have this conference with you. <laughs> Last but not least, I would like to welcome Stefan Lehne, our former political director and now visiting scholar at the Carnegie Europe. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, without overstating, the European neighborhood policy is a crucial point for Austria. Hardly any other EU country is as exposed to the developments in Eastern Europe. We have close historic, cultural and economic ties with the Eastern Partnership countries. Our energy supply and transport routes are linked to the region. And what most people in Austria, even in Austria, do not know is that the Ukrainian border is closer to Vienna than the Swiss border. More than a decade ago, the aim of the ENP was to create a ring of friends around the EU. And the assumption was that the partner countries would somehow peacefully converge towards European values and standards. The aim is still valid, but the assumption has proven to be wrong. We are witnessing a serious crisis in Ukraine, tensions in Moldova and Georgia, and terrible instability in the South. This experience shows that we have to adapt our neighborhood policy, and I'm happy that today we unite so many eminent people to discuss this matter um, for the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of the ongoing debate, I simply want to point out three political aspects that seem important to us here in Austria. First, the ENP should become more flexible. We have to change the one-size-fits-it-all policy and our neighborhood needs an approach which is more responsive to the different ambitions. The ENP should leave each partner country the freedom to develop its re uh, relationship with the EU in a different manner. Secondly, the ENP has to become more integrated. We have to start considering it more as a political means to create security around us. The ENP has therefore to become an integral part of EU's foreign policy. And thirdly, the ENP should become more geopolitical. It should avoid creating new dividing lines in Europe. We should look beyond our immediate borders and include our neighbors' neighbors. Let's take, for example, the case of Russia and the crisis in Ukraine. We cannot accept the illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia and its active support of separatist movements in the East. But at the same time, we need to find solutions reaching beyond the ceasefire. Our political guideline must be to move from a policy of either Europe or Russia to a logic of both Europe and Russia. In my opinion, we need to reduce the block thinking and find a solution offering Ukraine the possibility to establish strong economic ties with both the European Union and the Russian Federation. And I think the ENP should be part of this effort and contribute to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that the upcoming communication from the Commission will provide valuable indications for the way ahead. But still, a lot remains to be done, and the input by think tanks and civil society is for sure crucial to move the debate forward. I therefore wish you a 
productive conference. I would like to welcome you once again here in Vienna, and I hope that there will be a lot of innovative results which we can feed into the discussions in Brussels. Thank you once again for being here in Vienna, and thank you for your attention. Vater Minister, Ambassadors, um, members of the Diplomatic Corps, thank you very much for hosting us here today. It is a great opportunity for us at Carnegie Europe, based in Brussels, to venture out here into one of the great capitals of Europe and uh, to have a discussion about one of the most crucial policy fields that at the moment, I guess, need discussion uh, and, and where we urgently need to find approaches and ideas. Um, for Carnegie Europe, the neighborhood policy, um, the immediate neighborhood to the south and to the east of Europe, has traditionally been uh, in the limelight, very much you know, the focus of our work. And with Stefan Lehne and Marc Pirini and uh, Gwen Sassi and uh, Judy Dempsey, we have some of the main protagonists inside Carnegie Europe here today um, uh, who have given input to policymakers and to scholars. Um, alike. This is very much in the tradition also of Carnegie Europe trying to get out of the European bubble in Brussels and to go to the member states, to the capitals, and uh, feel the pulse of the debate there to find out, you know, what is the demand in these countries, what's their perspective, as any political bubble, um, you know, like Washington, like Berlin, um, like London and Paris, Brussels also breeds its own internal logic, and to get out of that logic and actually test it uh, and have it questioned is very, very much crucial for our efforts there. So we're talking about the neighborhood. And uh, if you follow the common narrative about the neighborhood, what you get is um, language and vocabulary of upheaval, uh, revolutions, the return of geopolitics, uh, the change of the landscape of Europe, really, and so on and so forth. And you could be under the impression that everything has changed. Um, and, and I think you can find quite a number of arguments that would back that up. But on the other hand, you could also make the case that nothing much has changed, actually. There's enormous continuity also in our neighborhood, not in a positive way, though. Um, continuity in the south, here we do have countries that have traditionally re uh, 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 reacted to modernization, to modernity and globalization with a mix of an arrested social development, um, you know, the uh, unraveling even of economic reform, not uh, progress at least, um, of, uh, of authoritarian rule and also um, of the social tightening, including um, religious fundamentalism as a result. That has been a development going on in the region for quite some time, and uh, so that's not necessarily all that new, only that it has reached perhaps a new culmination point. In the East, it's similar. In the East, Russia has traditionally, ever since the early 90s, reacted in the same way to any of the countries in its immediate neighborhood, you know, getting too close from a Moscow perspective to the West. It has created frozen conflicts. And it has just done so, in my opinion, also in Ukraine, like it has done so before in Moldova and in Georgia and in other places. So not really anything new, only a continuation of a trend, of a mega trend that we have seen developing over the last couple of years. So where does truth lie? Is this a new era? Is everything changed? Is there you know, a revolutionary kind of tide happening in both the East and the South? Or is this the mere continuation um, of something that we've seen for a long time? And I think that answer is just not, you know, the answer to that question is not just of economic, academic interest. In it lies also, I think, um, the, the, the kernel or perhaps the core um, of what can be an answer that the EU, the Europeans, uh, in their organized foreign policy <clears throat> can give to these developments there. For the past 20 years, no matter whether it's been a traditional development or a revolutionary development, these developments in the region have been too much for the EU really to manage. Our success rate, our aspirations, um, have not turned uh, into, into successes. And typically what has happened both in the south and in the east is when we bring our transformative agenda to these regions, we really want to change those places, we end up in a very perverse twist uh, of policy, actually supporting the status quo. Um, and that is really something that must you know, uh, be the result of some kind of very strong conceptual basic flaw built into our policies. And maybe we can discuss this today and find a way out. Today we talk in Brussels a lot about ENP reform, the reform of the European neighborhood policy. Um, there's a common kind of 
perception that the old policies as they um, you know, had been in place for some time now um, have been a failure. Uh, and now the question is, can we reform it? How much of an aspiration is there? How much political will will also come from the member states to feed it into it? The Brussels institutions cannot infuse the neighborhood policy with enough energy to basically you know, run the show from there. It needs to come from the member states, and not only from the classic big three or big seven, but from all member states to feed political support, political capital um, into this, especially when it's uncomfortable, especially when it's not popular at home. And so we have the conundrum here of external events and the reaction to it conceptually, but also the political capital that we have at home in a time when Europe itself and its internal problems are also not particularly small. So uh, it's a fantastic mix of all kinds of factors, um, hopefully not too big for us. Um, let me say thanks again uh, uh, to all of you for, for uh, having joined us here today in this fabulous venue. And I would like to give the word to Commissioner Han, who gratefully agreed to give a keynote address and will probably also give us a few hints as to how all of this is going to develop in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Teixeira. Dear Minister, Sebastian, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank and to congratulate the Austrian Foreign Minister and the Austrian Foreign Ministry um, and also Carnegie Europe for organizing uh, this event indeed, and I think it's a great idea to get out of the bubble, of the Brussels bubble, and to have this uh, event here in Vienna and uh, also for something, uh, for a good reason, which was just uh, uh, mentioned by Mr. Techau, I think it's important to have this infusion by member states uh, in the debate uh, and not only by the big three or however uh, who, uh, which uh, countries might uh, count to it, but by all member states. And it should be a debate uh, uh, where all member states participate and uh, may I say not only those who are bordering to the regions uh, or to the neighbors, but also others, the European Union is a composition of 28, and all 28 should participate in the um, opinion shaping process uh, concerning uh, the European neighborhood policy. And secondly, it's a great idea to organize this event uh, just now on Monday, uh, 1st, 2nd uh, of uh, uh, March. Anyhow, one could say at the eve of uh, the presentation of our Green Paper uh, uh, on Wednesday this week, uh, where we will present our ideas and our um, um, uh, proposals, how to further evolve the policy, and hopefully there will be a lot of contributions uh, till the end of this consultation process. Uh, I would say it should be by the end of, uh, or before summer break, so that means somehow uh, end of uh, July. But um, coming back, uh, um, the whole um, topic, uh, and I would like uh, uh, to ask you to take uh, your minds back to 2003. The EU is uh, on the brink uh, of its biggest ever enlargement. They called it uh, the Big Bang. They will, to follow our European model of democracy, of rule of law, of human rights, uh, and free markets, is bringing transformational change uh, to our Central and Eastern European friends. And uh, we can feel confident in our power as a pole of attraction for others. And uh, this is something, by the way, which is still the case today in 2015, as we can say, some aspirations of uh, some countries still having um, the intention to join sooner than later the European Union. But it was against this backdrop that uh, wider Europe was conceived as a way to use that power of attraction with countries who don't have a direct European perspective. More than a decade later, we and our neighborhood look rather different. Today's neighborhood is less stable than it was uh, 10 years ago. In the East, growing challenges to the Eastern partnership countries from crisis in Georgia in 2008 to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine have been caused by an increasingly assertive Russian foreign policy which denies 
the sovereign choice of our partners. In the south, Syria has been afflicted by a horrible civil war since 2011. Libya is a country in conflict, and this is a very modest description of the situation. The Middle East peace process is stalled, and Egypt uh, has undergone complex political change. The European Union and its partners are facing increased challenges from economic pressures, migration flows, and security threats. The vision we once had, the Union with its supposedly irresistible offer, and partners who would, to varying degrees, want to move closer to us, is clearly no longer apt. Our partners have diverging aspirations. Some have, indeed, chosen to move towards greater integration with us. But there are others who have remained ambivalent or have chosen in another path. The ENP has not always been able to offer adequate response to the changing aspirations of, of our partners, and we have to be self-critical on that matter. And therefore, the EU's uh, own interests have not been fully served either. Also, this is something we have to discuss much more uh, in this ongoing review process, how to um, respect much more European interests than it has been the case in the past. This is why President Juncker has asked me, in close cooperation with the High Representative uh, Federica Mogherini, to carry out a far-reaching review of this policy. Many member states, and indeed our partners, have already signaled they also believe change is necessary. The aim of the neighborhood policy was to create a zone of shared prosperity and stability on our borders, in the interests of our neighbors, but of course also in our own interests. That strategic goal remains unchanged. But in the new ENP that will emerge from the review, we need to be clear about our objective, and once again, I would like to stress it again and again, our interests. We want to be a key partner for the countries on our doorstep, while respecting their rights to choose their own way forward. We prefer to work with democracies in open trading relationships because we believe this is better for everyone. And we want to have a good working relationship on issues that affect us like energy security, counterterrorism, or migration. In the review, I believe we need to look at four key points. First, what can we do to increase the scope of differentiation in the way, they work, uh, the way we work with our partners. Some partners in the East are embarking on ambitious association and deep trade agreements, and although the scope of this has by far not been exhausted, already aspire to more, even to the perspective of EU membership in the very long term. We have partners in the South who are equally willing to work in the framework of very demanding agreements with us. But they know they have uh, no membership perspective. And we have a range of partners in both, in the South and the East, who have varying wishes to interact with us. On top of all this, we need to work out how to work with the neighbors of our neighbors, as it was already said by the Austrian minister. All this calls for some new ways of working that allows each of our partners to find their place in a relationship that fits their aspirations and, of course, ours. We need to do more to recognize that our partners are very diverse, not just different East and South, but different <clears throat> within the East and within the South. The second key element this brings me to ownership. We will never get the best from this policy while it is seen as something more or less imposed by Europe, precisely the European Union, rather than a partnership actively chosen by, other side, by the other side. The new ENP must reflect the views and the experience of our partners. It must not be condescending, patronizing, 
or breaching. We must ensure that we develop a real partnership of equals. And where partners are not engaging with us, we need to recalibrate to ensure that we are concentrating on areas where they and we have shared interests to pursue without compromising on basic universal principles. I believe that uh, to achieve greater ownership among our partners, we will need to bring more visible results with tangible benefits for their populations. People want to see results within a few years in order to understand if a policy has paid off. The third key element is to have a much stronger focus on fewer issues. I want to get away from the current model where we try to cover a very wide range of uh, sectors with every partner. For those that want and who are able, we should pursue the association agreements and the DCFTAs. But for those who can't or don't currently want to engage so deeply, let's narrow the focus to where the real interests lie and build on more solid foundations to make our partnership more effective. Trade and mobility have been the traditional focus points. I want to consider some that have not been fully used up to now. Energy, but our energy security and that of our partners. And threats to security from organized crimes to the frozen conflicts. The fourth and last key element uh, is uh, we need more flexibility. This means being, being able to react to changing circumstances and crises when they arise. These are just some of the ideas that you will find in the consultation paper, which we will publish, uh, as I have already said, later, later this week, exactly on Wednesday. We are determined to consult as widely as possible, particularly in the partner countries, to ensure that uh, this time we design a policy that is better designed to help us grow these uh, relationships. Your views are welcome too, and the consultation will, as I have already announced, uh, last till the end of uh, June, maybe even July. Also there we are flexible. Huh? We are not fixed on that, but uh, I would say end of July is uh, the latest date, and we have our famous summer break in Brussels, which doesn't mean uh, everybody is on holidays. Institutions should not be on holidays. Before I end, I would like uh, to say some people ask me whether all this talk of pursuing interest means that we are giving up on our values. The answer is very clearly no. It's important to stress this no. The promotion of democracy, human rights and the rule of law is a defining characteristic of the European Union. But let's ask ourselves uh, critical whether the EMP has currently constituted, has been the success we hoped in transmitting these values. It's my view that the values that are at the core of the EU are also in our partners' own interests. I will give you an example. Rule of law is key to long-term political stability, but equally to attracting outside investment. An independent judiciary and a system where justice is free from corruption is not only a value in itself, but it is also a key factor in the economic development of a country indispensable to creating an environment for growth. And again, not only for foreign investments, but also for um, local national investments. Let's make no mistake. The EU's current and future well-being is deeply interconnected with conditions just beyond our borders. Strengthening our neighbors, building more robust relations with each of them will make our own countries safer and therefore better places to live. That is why strengthening the ENP is a core project of the Juncker Commission. And helping our neighbors to develop modern democracy with strong economies 
helps to make them less vulnerable to outside pressures. I believe that Europe must take its responsibility in its own neighborhood even more proactively. We should not count on others, not, also not on others from other continents, to solve our problems. If we want to demonstrate that the EU matters in the world, surely it's in our own backyard that we must begin. Therefore, I wish you a really inspiring debate in my own very egoistic uh, interest, may I say, and I really regret not to participate uh, in the further discussions. I have seen uh, the program. It's a very interesting one. But fortunately, as it was already said, uh, Carnegie Europe is uh, participating by its uh, uh, representatives uh, extremely strong and vocal in the public debate. I thank you for that. And I would like to encourage you to continue, but I have no doubts this will be the case. Um, thanks again, and I wish you all the best in our joint interest. Uh, we need a strong ENP. We need a very active ENP. And let's not forget, it's in our own interest uh, to structure, to shape uh, our policy in order to have this uh, famous added value we expect from European policy. Thank you very much, and all the best. Let me ask my panelists to join me on the panel here. Frau Frau Harra, Sie sind hier. Florence, du bist hier. Thank you. Sehr gerne. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's delve right into this. Um, we have uh, tossed a coin and we ended up deciding that the southern neighborhood should be going first. <coughs> and that is perhaps for a reason. If you do remember, um, you know, only 10 uh, years ago, um, when you looked at EU foreign policy ambition, there were really, you know, only two parts of its immediate neighborhood that received overwhelming attention, and that was the Balkans on the one hand and the southern neighborhood on the other. There were really only two foreign policy teams in Brussels. One was the Balkans team and one was the Middle East team. Um, and, uh, and those have been, you know, the kind of core incubators of, of EU foreign policy uh, talent, um, and that's where ambition was. Uh, in the southern neighborhood particularly, there was ambition um, and, uh, and, and, and very high hopes um, that things could be turned by the European Union, not alone, um, but in conjunction with the actors in the region into something much, much better. And since then, the southern neighborhood has uh, seen a stellar downgrade um, on the Brussels scene, perhaps a bit provocative, a stellar downgrade in the sense that what was once one of the fields, uh, main fields of foreign policy ambition is now perhaps one of the biggest examples of how we were unable to achieve what we wanted to achieve, uh, and where the failure of our transformative agenda is perhaps most blatantly visible. And so um, it perhaps behooves as well to start to talk about the European southern neighborhood first. And the southern neighborhood, as you all know, is not a neighborhood as such. It is, you know, a pretty, you know, uh, 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 roughly lumped together part of the world that we call the southern neighborhood, it, it really at least falls into three subregions: northern Africa, the eastern Mediterranean, or the Levant, and then the Gulf region. Uh, and even that doesn't really do justice to the diversity of the region because it's, it's much, much more than this. And in North Africa alone, you have countries like Tunisia and Libya in one basket. Uh, and we all know um, that that doesn't really fit and that we can't have the same answers to the problems of these two ones, and that's just an example. So um, I would uh, like to go right into this. The EU has a lot of potentialities in the region. It is a potential trading partner, and it is, of course, a current trading partner. It is a recipient country of migration. 
It is a donor. It is also an investor. Um, it is a mediator and perhaps even an intervener, perhaps even a military intervener on occasion. And uh, these are just five or six of the roles that the EU can identify for itself when it starts to look at its role in the region. And perhaps we will touch upon some of these during the discussion. Um, I have a full panel here. We have uh, five panelists, and we only have very limited time, so I ask uh, my panelists not to give us really kind of longer intro statements, but to go into a discussion right away, which I will try to keep alive and, and going. Um, and I would like to start with Gudrun Hara, sitting right next to me, um, who, of course, is working for Der Standard, is the executive editor there, um, also spent a lot of time in the region, is a noted Middle East expert. And I would like to ask you a very simple, perhaps, uh, uh, intro question. And, and to take a step back from the EU neighborhood policy and also its technicalities, how much do you think can the West, how much can Europe actually achieve in the region, um, in the ideal case or perhaps in, a, in the current environment? And you think it's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> I always take the easy ones. Um, well, in, the, in, the, in this moment, I think it's... I mean, we hardly can describe what's going on. I mean, we are, uh, people like myself, we are concentrating on trying to, to get everything, all different levels of conflict, of, of uh, uh, yes, of uh, what's, what's going on in the region. It's not only one conflict, it's not only three conflicts, it's, uh, as I said, different levels within conflicts, and we are, it's very hard uh, just to understand, uh, understand it. So without understanding, it's also very <laughs> hard to, to intervene. And perhaps uh, the most important thing would be to stop thinking that uh, intervention or action A produces result B. I mean, what we are seeing all the time here are totally paradox results. I mean, we even could call the Islamic State the paradox result of the US invasion in Iraq in 2003. But I, I'm not only talking about military, the military side. For example, if you look what happened in the museum in Mosul uh, last week. Also, this is a paradox result, perhaps, of attempts to control the antiques market, for example. No? So um, we, in, in the moment, you need more uh, <laughs> experts on perhaps communication and how these groups commun communicate than experts on the region or on Islam or Islamism or you name it. I have a quick follow-up yeah. for you. Um, based on my original question, which was how much can we actually achieve? Mm. Let me rephrase that slightly. Do you think our ambition in the region is too high or too low? Um, it's too high because it also we st uh, should stop thinking that everything which we, I mean, our concepts and ideas are perceived and seen in the region in the same way than we mean and see and perceive them. No? I mean, uh, we have lost, of course, uh, lots of reputations during the last years. We have perhaps done the wrong things. I mean, not always it's our mistake. I mean, sometimes we mean well and uh, it, it arrives in a different way. Which is way. often the worst, yeah. if you mean well. Yeah. I, want, I want to move over to, to Michael Köhler, um, who has been a player in this field on the EU side for quite some time. Um, one of the key players in the European Commission, also currently in, in, the, in the neighborhood policy, and he's been active both in the eastern and the southern part, but we all know that his, his real heart is in the south and has traditionally been there. And, uh, and I would like to come back to some of the things that were said in the intro uh, when, we had, when we had the speeches. Um, you must be, of course, as a player and as somebody who represents also the, the kind of combined foreign policy oomph of the EU in a way, you have to be an optimist, you know, by trade. Has the European neighborhood policy failed? And if so, yeah, if, if yes, why? And, and if not, you know, what actually was good about it in the past couple of years? What, what is the criterion for failure? Mm. Is the criterion for failure uh, that <clears throat> we have not turned uh, the entire region to a flourishing economic uh, and totally democratic uh, area? I mean, if that is the criterion, then of course we would speak about failure. I would say, the, the neighbor policy is not a, a bonanza, but it is a toolbox. Uh, the question is, are the tools in that toolbox fitting for the situations that we find in the, situ in, in the region? And secondly, are the craftsmen 
that use those tools able, so to say? Are they well trained enough to use them? And I would say uh, you find probably as many uh, success stories in neighborhood policy as you find probably stories of failure. So the question for me is not so much is it a failure or is it a, a, a success story, but have we been able enough to use those tools and uh, what do we need to do now to be perhaps uh, a little bit more able than in the past? Let me get in there real quick because one of the crucial things where criticism always you know, is pointed um, is the relationship between the EU institutions with whom you've been now for you know, your career and the member states who are really the masters of EU foreign policy. And the relationship between the two need to be tight and the member states need to infuse all of this with power and, and have to give the political capital to the institutions, otherwise they can't do it. Is the relationship between the institutions, your part of the equation, and the member states, is it good enough? Um, and, and do you receive the support that you need when you go out there into the region and implement EU policies? Um, I would say uh, it's uh, not operational enough, this relationship. I mean, we, we talk a lot. There's not a single foreign affairs council where not uh, two or three neighborhood issues would be on the agenda, like Libya, like Syria, like the Ukraine, and so forth. So in terms of exchange of information, also on the services level, it's next to perfect. The question is, do we act on the knowledge that we have? First between member states and institutions. And there I would say there's a long way to go to come to uh, a level of perfection. We still have the, uh, a sort of burden sharing between the institutions and member states. Member states are finding it very convenient to pursue, for example, their bilateral economic interests, including arms trade interests, and relegating, for example, human rights dialogues and other things to the institutions. That's, that's a problem. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that we do enough in order to muster support for our objectives uh, in neighborhood policy. We don't speak enough with the countries, both institutions and member states together, and we don't speak enough to, with those other countries, neighbors of the neighbors, but also others, that have a stake in the neighborhood. When would we have ever uh, talked to the Saudis, for example, about their interests in the neighborhood? Not only as the European Commission or the External Action Service, but uh, member states uh, and the Brussels institutions together. And I think there can be a healthy overlap of interests. <coughs> when would we have ever talked to the Turks about this, for example? This is very rare. So I think we are, we are not, uh, let's say, at the level of, of, of possibilities for the time being. We can do better with the tools that we have. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. And I want to come back to some of these issues, but I would like to move over to Florence. Florence Gaub is with the EU's um, own strategic research institute. It's in-house think, think tank, the EU ISS in Paris. Uh, and Florence has been uh, focusing on Middle Eastern and Arab affairs for quite some time now. And I would like to ask you a specific question, uh, perhaps on the mindset that the Europeans bring to the region. For a long, long time, this was thought about and acted uh, you know, on, within the framework of development, development cooperation, development aid, even in earlier times. And now all of a sudden we look at the region and we see ISIS and we see Syria and we see Libya and we see military intervention, we see terrorism and extremism and all of a sudden it's not a development issue, it's a security issue. Have we properly accounted for mentally in our kind of thinking about the region for the fact that this has moved perhaps away from being a mere development issue to now being a very hard security issue as well? Well, I assume that when you say we, you mean the European Union, because I think at the member states level, there's a bit of a different discussion. You have some member states that are very much aware uh, of, of the security dimension and always have been, or for a long time at least, and others that have been less so. So as a result, you have, uh, I, I think of it a bit of, like a Catholic marriage in the sense, security and development, you know, even if it's unhappy, you cannot divorce the two. And in, in the EU, because of many member states not wanting to relegate defense and security issues to the EU, we have a very, as you said, developmental uh, tone to it, but that's not because the EU um, as, a, as an a actor wanted that, but because the member states don't want to mix the two, security and development. Uh, even now, when you look at something rather mundane like posting defense attaches in the EU delegations, there are member states that really don't want it or that are okay with it, but only if you don't call them defense attaches and things like that, and they're not allowed to wear uniforms. So um, while the two then are traditionally, not just in the EU, I think everywhere, uh, at odds with each other, you know, security and development communities are really as I said, a bit of an unhappy marriage, they cannot go without each other. And this is where we really don't have a choice. 
uh, as you said, the, the, the two are linked. You cannot have security without development, and development or underdevelopment breeds insecurity. Are we ready for it? I think um, on the EU side, that would be definitely the need, things need to be done, but where it all begins is at the member states level. And if the member states are not willing to, to let the EU take on that role, then it's actually futile to just think about it. Let me also switch the perspective here. This was not the European perspective, if you will. Um, you have spent a lot of time also doing research in the region, actually. <clears throat> when you look at what you see there and when you talk to people on the ground, if, is the EU seen as a relevant security player or the member states by the people in the region, or are we kind of kidding ourselves here and perhaps overemphasize our own role? Um, both. <laughs> This academic answer. Um, in, in, on the one hand, we are not the many Arab states don't make the distinction between member states and the EU on the one hand, or even member states and NATO. So for them, it's all kind of the same thing. So you have certain states like France, like the United Kingdom, Italy, depending on where you are, who are seen as you know security actors. Um, but others that are simply not. Um, I think when you look at Libya, this is an interesting case. UBAM Libya, this small mission that has been, you know, criticized for, I think, a lot of valid but also unjust reasons, is a very civilian mission. But in Libya, border management is not done by civilians, not done by the police, it's done by the armed forces. So here you have the Libyan armed forces looking at the European police officers going, you know, like, who are you? You know, there's also, there's not just development security, there's also police and military, as you know, that have a bit of an unhappy marriage. So we need to realize that in these countries, security is not a civilian issue, it's a military issue. And uh, I think we bring a lot to the table, but some of us are seen as security actors, some of us less so. Lots of unhappy marriages. Yes. <laughs> um, I, let me switch to uh, Cengiz Gunai, who's here at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, a notable scholar on the region. Um, has worked on, um, on, on Arab politics, on, on Turkish EU relations, and, and, and other issues, including um, you know, uh, fundamental Islam. And I wanted to ask you something about, um, I wanted to ask you, what, what's our problem with the South? We are 28, um, and when you're at 28, not only is it difficult to identify you know, policy prescriptions or policies that you can agree on, but it's often also difficult for us to even define what the problem is. And I think, uh, you know, we just heard it also from others. What is our major problem in the region? And how, how, how do we approach it with the right mindset? I think one of the major problems is that we see the, we, Europe, sees the region through the security perspective. I think this is after the uh, end of the Cold War, the uh, South has become more of a security interest rather than of any other interest. And uh, because you asked before whether uh, the development dimension has lost and the security dimension has gained ground, I think the security dimension was always a more heavy part of that relationship between the, uh, the North and the South. Um, the region has been seen as a source for terrorism, for spillover effects of terrorism, energy issues, all these kind of things which are really strong re strongly related with security issues. And uh, I think um, it is also the global discourse which has shaped strongly the view of the region in Western minds, let's say. It is, it is always problematic, the view. It is the, 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 the region has been perceived as a region with many problems. Uh, which is of course also true, but it is only through one perspective that this region has been perceived. And I think another dimension we should also be aware of is that how Europe is perceived from the other side of, uh, of the Mediterranean. Uh, Europe has a very long history of, uh, and a very influential, or let's say recent rather, history of colonialism in that region. And this, is, this still has a strong impact on people. I think we, we, we as Europeans often forget that. I have a quick question um, on the role of the United States for you, because when you are a scholar in the region, that's obviously the one big elephant in the room that you can't not mention. Um, and it is the much more strategic player in the sense that it does have the military hard power kind of force uh, to issue security guarantees and intervene, you know, uh, completely different from uh, the, the abilities and capabilities that the EU brings to bear, but it also has different interests. Um, and, uh, and perhaps its role as a global kind of superpower, you know, also mandates that. Um, are, we, are we enough, you know, coordinating with the Americans? Should we distance ourselves more from their approach to the region? Is there such a thing as the West or is this, a, you know, too, too loose a connection there? 
I think when it really comes to strategic interests, it's actually the US which is directing also European policies in that regard. I don't see any very independent European position towards that region. I mean, uh, let's say the, the approach or how the EU uh, wants to change things in the region might be different. I think the methods are different, but uh, let's say uh, the, the, the aim or the interests are rather similar. And I don't, and particularly considering that EU foreign policy or neighborhood policy has been strongly shaped by the big member states, which are of course also closely allied with the US. So I think when it really comes to uh, geopolitical interests in the region, it is still the US which is dominating also European minds. Is there thinking. enough breathing space for the Europeans to yes, come Yes, of course, I think. Better. We just should be, um, in approaching the region, I think one of the things which are, is really important is more humbleness. I think it is a big chance that Europe is in a deep crisis, as the region is in deep crisis, and both being in crisis would actually open new channels of, uh, of, for dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, to, to Mark. Um, Mark Pirini is a, a, a former EU ambassador to four Arab countries, including Tunisia, where he's just returned from, uh, and, uh, and also Syria, but also to Ankara, and who's now a Carnegie scholar uh, in Brussels, working with us very closely. And, and before we you know, talk about Tunisia, where we've just returned from, uh, I wanted to ask you something more about, you know, about Brussels real quick. Um, we all agree that the neighborhood policy needs to change and that the instruments have not really produced the kinds of results uh, and, and, uh, and that you know, much needs to be done. When you re try to read the Brussels scene, what do you see? Do you see ambition? Do you see new thinking? Do you see a new approach? Or are we going to be you know, disappointed at the Riga summit where we are, we'll do some public stock taking and where people will look at the EU and say, hey, let's see what they have. Well, I first see um, that we confronted with a completely changed uh, set of values, if we can call that values, in, in the neighborhood, <clears throat> in the southern neighborhood. We have a deeply entrenched Islamo-conservatism everywhere. And this is not limited to Islamic parties. It's everywhere in the society. Add to this the uh, deep resentment towards the West and the EU on Palestine for a long time, on Syria, recently on, on migration, add to this the uh, very rapid successes of ISIS in Syria, Iraq, and Libya now. So we're not just you know, about to propose our values and more for more and what else, as we've done in the past few years. This is not the mood in the region. So my hope is that uh, when the commissioner uh, gets to this debate on the paper to be adopted uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, there is a more modest approach, uh, that there is a, a perception that we're not expected there. The Tunisians didn't do their revolution because of us, or at least very, very remotely, perhaps. Certainly not the Tunisians and so on. So we are in a different uh, environment, which is imposed by the region, and where violence and, and uh, conflicting values are at the core of the whole thing. So that imposes on us as EU, of course, uh, not Carnegie, um, a much more flexible, versatile toolbox, a rapidity in changing, adjusting, uh, and, and that is going to be the essence. Before we go back to the in instruments and the, the humility that I think both of you have now mentioned, uh, and, and which came up earlier here as well. Let me ask you just real quick for one and a half sentences on Tunisia. And I'm asking this specifically, not only because you've just returned from there, which actually, uh, Michael Köhler, uh, you, you were there at the and, same time. And the, co the EU counterterrorism coordinator was there too. Yes, that's <laughs> a scary thought. Um, the, the, <laughs> that's uh, the new troika. <laughs> the, the, the question that I have uh, to you is Tunisia is often seen as the one kind of you know, beacon of hope. That's the country that has gone halfway through a political process and yeah. a new constitution is in place and so on and so forth. You know, is this the one that we should focus on? Is this the low hanging fruit for us? Or how yeah. optimistic are well, you? Well, uh, the whole Western community is in awe with the uh, Tunisia transition for four years, with uh, the current setup, a president and a coalition government, and with the Islamic party. We have to be careful with all this. Uh, of course, the Tunisians have achieved a few things. They have a president democratically elected. They have an assembly democratically elected. They have decided on an unlikely coalition, but they have it. 
and they have a new constitution, and they are working towards a constitutional court and a higher judicial council. This is all fine, except that none of the roots of the revolution has seen a, a, a solution so far, neither in the economic field or in the consensus building field. So, fine. Problem is that you have this unlikely coalition between staunch liberals, urban liberals, academics, and so on, and an Islamic party. I spent uh, something like an hour with Mr. Hanushi on, on Friday. It's all fine. I mean, the perfect organization. You've never seen this in any uh, other uh, Islamic party other than the AKP, of course. Um, you know, you're, you're there on time. They are 15 minutes late. They, they send you a message. Uh, the photograph is there, and the picture is on Twitter uh, a minute after, et cetera, et cetera. Except that his project so far, unless he changes it, is to transform the society, and not in a direction that we like. But we have an entry point there. One, because he's a governing party now, so he wants to stay there, uh, and that's why he's, he's, he's <coughs> there. And second, because he's scared of ISIS. He's scared of Libya. And therefore, he started moving. And this is where we get back to the policy mix that we use. It is very important when we talk to Tunisia, one, to talk to government and to the civil society, because this might be a different set of values and interests, and the society is diverse and polarized. And two, that when we talk to the government, we talk with our interest in, in view. And, and as remote as it may seem, our security interest might coincide with Enala's political interest. This is completely new for us. We've never done things in that way for us, EU. I want to take this thought and move over to the other end to, uh, to Michael Köhler, who's also just returned. And I want to ask you the question, political Islam obviously is one of the big um, you know, issues that we kind of try to think around and, and through. Um, and would you agree that, that you know, in a sense, Tunisia is a test case for whether a, a, an Islamic party, a political Islam, can stay moderate enough to accommodate modernization? Um, or whether that you know, movement is destined to you know, drift into the extremes again. You know, wh how do you read the situation? Is Tunisia that test case for us? It's one of the test cases. I mean, Morocco is another test case. Of course, the, the general scenario is different. One, you have a very strong monarchy, and it's not a country that has gone through the same level of democratic evolution. But still, um, the moment comes in the uh, evolution of, 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 of those countries where this huge Islamic or Islamist movement uh, whose own, uh, let's say, only, only point of, 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 uh, of uh, 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 unanimity, so to say, was opposition against an autocratic regime, splits up. It can split up in a, in a variety of directions. You have Salafist movements on the one hand that, uh, let's say, operate outside of the law. You have other Salafist movements that try to be part of the political landscape. You have, uh, let's say, more traditional Islamist movements, and you have even some sort of uh, modernizing Islamist movements. And that is what we are, what we are seeing uh, in, in Tunisia. And in uh, Tunisia, we see, as Mark very rightly said, a movement that does not only pursue its own course, but that also reacts to international developments, like the ones in Egypt, for example. So we are going to see this in a couple of countries, but of course, we objectively have a very strong interest in helping the Tunisians uh, to be a success story. We cannot turn Tunisia into a success story ourselves, but we can try to be helpful. Uh, helpful in two ways. On the one hand, of course, to assist, even materially, financially. And there again, I come back to the point that, well, you can put a lot of trust in the Brussels institutions, but uh, even all the coffers of Brussels will not do the trick uh, alone. You need to have an international kind of support effort that brings together EU member states, the IFIs, uh, and Brussels, and so forth. And then you have somewhat, uh, uh, let's say, an element of clout. But at the same time, you also need to push them to go for the right policy. My major concern, having returned from Tunisia on uh, Saturday, is not uh, the security situation, although it is uh, a, a major point of concern. My major point of concern is the uh, lackluster economic situation which has to do with the fact that there is no investment going into this country, and this is not the only country that is uh, not attractive to investment, and this has to do with the fact that nobody sees a reform-mindedness in those people that represent the government. You could even argue that Anahda, which is now a government party, is even the more reform-minded wing of the uh, government, but our traditional interlocutors in Nida Tunis, including the president, I think have a lot of kind of uh, at least uh, silent opposition against two radical reforms 
uh, that would uh, change uh, something, uh, including the power balance of, 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 of uh, those people who are running the country. Uh, this is the problem. I mean, security is a big problem, but we all know the socio-economic dimension of soci uh, security. And if I have one major concern for the entire region, that is that investment is going down. If investment goes down, at the same time demography goes up, you have no job creation, and you will very, very quickly, including in Egypt, end up in a situation that has the same kind of mixture of ex explosives that led us into the Arab Spring in 2011. One of the, the obstacles to investment, you know, from my very limited experience in the region, also seems to be that, of course, these countries, not only do they find it hard to reform at home, but then they also don't really deal and trade and cooperate with each other much. You know, it has been an EU concern for quite some time during the Barcelona process and then afterwards, you know, to stimulate cooperation between them, but they're quite reluctant to embrace this. You know, can we find, based on all of that experience, a new approach to this? Or is it, are we in the end just you know, bystanders who can't really massage them into, into working more with each other? Well, apparently, so far, the kind of bonus on South-South cooperation was simply not <clears throat> savvy enough, was not interesting enough. Uh, it is true that for the past 20 years, uh, the, uh, the uh, rate, so to say, of South-South uh, uh, economic exchanges stands at around 5%. In some countries it's 6%, some countries it's 3%, but on average, three, 5%. A country like Tunisia does about 70% of its forex exchanges with the European Union, about 5% with its neighbors. And it's one of the most open countries in trade. How can this change? Now, we tried to have a great idea about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, with the so-called Agadir Agreement. The Agadir Agreement brings together Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan, the first four countries that concluded an association agreement with the European Union, and try to, let's say, uh, transpose the same kind of agreement that they have with the European Union individually to each other. We even start a, a, a process, not only a political process, but we have them technically. There is a secretariat of the Agadir Agreement, which is based in Amman, and the Secretary General, who is the former Secretary General of the Moroccan Industry for Trade and Industry, so a very qualified person. The point is, however, that despite all the activities of these people, nothing happens. Why? Nothing happens, because there is no political will. In December, I was in Morocco, and I asked them about uh, market trade exchanges. And both on the political side, but also entrepreneurs told me, listen, what has happened, for example, with Tunisia, is that after the Arab Spring, they increased the level of non-tariff trade, uh, uh, non -non trade barriers because they wanted to protect their economy in this very fragile situation. So there is a potential for Moroccan Tunisian exchanges, but this is now lower than three or four years back because of the, let's say, very difficult situation that there is. The answer is, if we want to do something, we need to make the markets more attractive and probably we need to link it closer to the European market. I'll give you one example. In May 2010, uh, the uh, Maghreb ministers of energy met in Algiers and signed a declaration establishing or a perspective of a Maghreb-wide electricity market. Why? Because they wanted to become attractive for European investment in renewable energy. And you have already a high voltage line from Morocco to Spain, there will be another one from Tunisia to, uh, to Italy. So you could perfectly well, and the Commission has proposed this on a couple of examples, link the electricity market of northern Africa to the European electricity market with two advantages. On the one hand, they could export excess production from wind energy, solar energy, but also other forms of energy to Europe. At the same time, uh, during peak hours, they can import and let's stabilize the system in northern Africa. Don't forget that all the northern African countries have every year a rise of 6, 7, 8 percent in electricity consumption, so they need to have the stability. We have to relaunch this kind of offer, and this is just the area of electricity. Maybe it is possible to, to let's say, infuse some economic dynamism by bringing their markets closer to the European market. The problem is, however, let's be realistic, that changes in market structures always raise also questions of power distribution. And I don't mean electric power here. Uh, and there are people who win and there are other people who lose. And even if 90% win and only 10% lose, 
maybe the 10% losers are powerful enough to, to slow down the process. Thank you. This is also a glimpse into you know, some of the technicalities where you have a good big idea and then you have to break it down into the, into the technocratic nightmare that it then becomes when you actually want to implement it. So the small scale stuff is very much connected to the big picture. I want to make things even more complicated by tossing in the Israeli-Palestine peace process mm. um, because that, you know, some people say, has been kind of the general you know, poison that permeates the entire relationship um, you know, of, of, of Europe, you know, with the region, but basically also works as a pretense for many of the other kind of conflicts to be maintained in the region. And um, I wanted to ask uh, 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 um, uh, Cengiz first, because I know that he's the kind of a pan-regional kind of scholar as well, to what extent he thinks that this is, you know, something that the EU needs to address more aggressively. Uh, Ms. Mogherini, when she first came into office, was very ambitious, then kind of backpedaled and has reduced her activity because she felt she couldn't really do much. Is this something that without this, our neighborhood policy will be incomplete, or should we stay away from it because it's too poisonous and we can't be a player anyways? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the Middle East conflict is um, a big problem, of course, and um, it... Um, it is related to what I said before, that um, I think the European Union is not perceived in such different way from the region as the US, as long as it acts as the West, particularly in regard to the Middle East conflict. It is, people in the region won't make a big difference between Germany's, the UK's, or Washington's stance towards, uh, towards uh, the, the, the Middle East conflict. So I think, Yes, this is a big problem and it should be addressed, but I'm not sure if, I mean, we've seen so many uh, uh, secretaries of state uh, going very ambitiously in, <laughs> um, into the, 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 the issue and, and uh, when expectations are very high, usually uh, disappointment is, uh, is big. So I don't know, I, I have no, no real answer to that, but I would like to add something which was raised before that um, uh, the, the problem of Islamists. And um, um, I think uh, one of the major problems in the region, or also how we perceive the region, it is not about Islamists versus secularists, and here are the good ones and here are the bad ones. I think the problem is that um, regardless of Islamists or secularists, I think there is a problem of authoritarian mindset. And this has to do with the the, the setting of the nation state, the modern nation state, how, how it was implemented in the region, which is very much security focused and very over centralized. So it's always about getting a hold of the state and the state institutions. And I think there is no big difference in how Islamists act from, from, from secularists. And if you look at secular uh, opposition groups, how they have tried to deal with the threat of Islamism, they, that was not very democratic, to be honest. Uh, most of them have tried to bring in either the military or, or foreign forces uh, to beat the, the Islamists in their own uh, uh, society. So I think a major problem is authoritarianism and then authoritarian let, mindset. Let me follow up with this real quick, because um, uh, we heard from Michael Köhler that, and from also from Mark, that the, the, uh, the, the Islamist party in Tunisia you know, is looking very closely at some of the examples that they see that happened in Egypt and, and elsewhere, you know, where you know, their political you know, comrades, if you will, you know, uh, underwent a certain kind of development. Now the question is, I mean, when they can learn from the example that others have said, what have we learned in our dealings with Islamist parties? You know, our dealings with the Egyptian case hasn't been particularly, you know, uh, successful, actually not, not stellar at all. You know, have we developed, a, you know, a more pragmatic or perhaps a more mature kind of approach to this? Or are we just as puzzled as we used to be in the past when we have to deal with these folks? I think one of Europe's major problems is that we have a very normative understanding of how institutions should look like, particularly when we talk about civil society, for instance. We have a very clear idea of what is civil society, even though it's not true. We don't really have a clear concept of civil society, but as if we had a concept, we are dealing with civil society in the region in the same way. So what we detect as a civil society is secular civil society organizations, um, which are often part of a civil society industry, which is actually only alive because of external funding 
from European states or, or let's say, the West in big terms. So um, we don't, we, I, I mean, I think this is one of the major problems of the, of the European approach towards the region. There are, even within Europe now, so many new developments. If you look to southern European countries, like social movements, platforms evolving, all these kind of things, we can't really ignore them in uh, approaching this region. And I think this region is particularly interesting because there are so many examples of that. In Egypt, for instance, uh, just before um, uh, Mursi was removed, there was actually a, a flourishing um, alternative, let's say, um, um, uh, civil society uh, emerging. Many platforms of young people not institutionalized, uninstitutionalized. And if you look at the trends, there are several trends looking at um, on, in what do people believe, what makes a change. It's less civil society, it's not more any more political parties, it is individual uh, involvement. So I think this is this is something new which is emerging not only in the in the region. We will see it also in European countries, and I think we should be prepared to that. If if I talk in the name of the European Union, I think it is it is important to leave these standardized concepts which don't really fit anymore. Laurence, you and your capacity as as a as a researcher at EUISS, you're also advising uh, policymakers in the EU institutions, and uh, and and. From the questions you get, from the demand that you receive as a scholar, how do you assess their thinking? And, and what, I mean, where, is, where do you think is the biggest, biggest kind of, um, maybe ambition is not the right word, I've used it too many times already, but where's the biggest hunger for information on behalf of the decision makers? And what do you, what do you deduct from this in terms of the approach of the EU to the region? I think it echoes the question you asked me earlier about security. There are questions about security, and, but that's you know, kind of the nature of the beast, the fact that the EU traditionally has had a not so much security focused uh, look on the region, now tries to understand you know, what, 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 who are the actors actually on the ground, the armed forces, the police, who can we deal with? Uh, what's your assessment on that? That's one of the questions I'm being asked. The other is actually echoes what, what, what uh, you just mentioned, the issue of Islamists. What kind of Islamists are there? Who can we deal with? Who can we not deal with? So in, in other words, it's, we're looking for actors. That, that's my impression. Who can we actually engage with? And I think that's, of course, the nature of affairs. You have to have a counterpart. And this also explains in part why Libya has not been just failed by the international community. There was also a time after 2011 when the phone rang in Tripoli and nobody was there to actually pick it up. You need actors on the other side, otherwise you, all your efforts uh, will be futile. Um, these, are, these are broadly, I'd say, the, the two main issues, trying to understand security and trying to understand who the actors are that we can deal with, can we deal with them and under which circumstances. So what is the secret, secret Florence Gaub recipe of dealing with these islamists? <laughs> <laughs> what are the two main points that you give your counterparts when, you, when they ask you, how shall we deal with these people? Well, the sad story is, um, it's, a, it's a difficult story to tell because there are no good and bad guys. So we're not watching a Western here. Uh, everyone wants to know, actually, also what you just said, you know, who do we place our bets on because someone will come out on the other side and we want to be sure that they're the winners. We do not know, and actually Frau Hara said that earlier as well. Uh, we, the picture is moving so fast we don't know where to go. So that would be the one uh, recommendation is to keep channels open to everyone because we don't know who six months from now will still be there. Um, the second thing is I don't think it's the time now to go way too normative into, into the discussion when you talk Islamists. There are, uh, you, you asked earlier, have we learned some lessons about how we deal with Islamists? I think we have. I think 10 years ago, Islamists meant Al-Qaeda. Now we've understood Al-Qaeda. Then, then we had a Hamas phase where we understood it can also mean some, someone who's been <laughs> elected and we don't like it. And then we have the Nahda Islamist phase where we have parties in power that are still Islamists, but okay, they have a democratic mandate, we're able to deal with them. So there are so many Islamists now, it's a green sea of those that we actually have to distinguish now, not by what they want to achieve, because as, as Mark said earlier, they all have the same goal at the end of the day, uh, depending on, you know, there are nuances of course, but it is the establishment of a, of a state that follows Islamic principles, not all want the same 
extent, but still. And then you have different, different tactics, basically. And I think this is where we have to distinguish. You have what I call the revolutionary Islamists, uh, basically the terrorist groups. You have the progressive Islamists, the, the political parties. And then you have Islamists in Iran and in Saudi Arabia that are simply authoritarian. So way too early to hedge our bets and keep all channels open. And now is not the time And here. Just if I can open one historical par parenthesis, will Anahta evolve? Quite possibly, the German, um, German Social Democratic Party evolved from a socialist party wanting to topple the system as it was into a party that eventually played the rules of the game. So everything is possible, but it doesn't mean it will happen. May I add something? Sure. <laughs> um, because, I mean, this is a really engaging Islamists. I mean, everybody after the first elections in Egypt, parliamentary elections and then presidential elections, it was the most natural and logic thing for us to engage with these people. I mean, how could we not? Huh? But at the same time, we did it and we lost a big part of the society. And still we, we have a big promo, a problem of uh, trying to explain what we meant by engaging with those people who then were rejected by a big part of society. I mean, I don't have to tell you. I mean, there are the theories uh, going on that, I mean, the West, United States, European Union, European Union, no difference, wanted to have the Islam, um, Arab states, uh, states in the Middle East, Muslim brothers' governments to keep them quiet, to keep uh, Salafis away from us and so on. So <laughs> this is what I meant. I mean, when I said uh, not always what we are thinking to do uh, is perceived in the same way in the region. No? I have two quick questions, one to you, Udrun, and one to Mark, before I open it up to you. And I would like to ask you to get your questions ready, because we will take at least one round of questions from the audience. My question to you has to do with Islamism, and you've just mentioned it. And that is the question that, of course, this issue doesn't only play out in the region, it also plays out here at home. And, uh, and you, as somebody who's responsible for a newspaper, I'm sure you'll get you know, hundreds and hundreds of letters and perhaps emails of people you know, having their own sometimes quite drastic opinions on how we should deal with that issue. And Minister Kurz, who uh, spoke to us earlier, of course, is responsible for uh, a law that was passed here in Austria the other day you know, about how Austria should you know, uh, deal with, with you know, foreign financed Islamism at home. My question to you is, you know, there's a lot of fear in the debate. Uh, and a lot of misunderstandings domestically, but perhaps also a few clear-sighted people. To what extent is our foreign policy hijacked by the fear at home about Islamism? Well, uh, I, I, I think it is. Uh, but uh, I mean, not only our foreign policy, but sometimes also what we are doing here at home. No? I mean, uh, I, I think the Islam law, in a, in a sense, it will, is a good example for that, because we will always remember the circumstances when it was written. No? So it's not for, I mean, I, I feel this is unfortunate. I don't criticize the law now, but uh, there are some things which it's not, uh, it would have been uh, written better in other circumstances, I think. No? But of course also the foreign policy. I mean, you know, this uh, extremist question, of course there are common denominators between the people fighting there and our young people who, who run there, for example, fight against imperialism and, and, and freedom and, and uh, exactly the same issues uh, 30 years ago were hijacked by the radical left. I mean, we, we should remember this. But the motivation here for these people is different. I mean, it's also very much uh, homegrown issues. Uh, I mean, uh, if, uh, if somebody from Tikrit, from a Sunni tribe, uh, they are fighting today, decides uh, against or for ISIS, it has difficult, uh, dif completely different reasons than uh, what, what's, what's being radicalism here. No? All right, I just wanted to mention this because we do have this Islamist issue, of course, also playing out at home. My, my final question is to Mark. Um, uh, we heard from, from um, Michael Köhler in the very beginning, he said, you know, when have we ever talked to the Turks about all of this? And you've been ambassador to, to Ankara. Uh, you've talk, uh, talked to the Turks quite a bit about these issues. The Turks themselves have the ambition of being a, an important player in the Arab world and in the Middle East as such. Uh, you know, coming you know from their cultural and and their religious kind of you know heritages there, but of course that hasn't really worked out quite well. How important is Turkey in all of this, and to what extent do we need to cooperate with the Turks on the Middle East? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm glad you're talking about Turkey because 
I think uh, uh, revising the ENP and leaving aside Western Balkans and Turkey is something of an artificial uh, thing to do. It's, it's projecting our division of labor in Brussels into policy making, and there is less and less uh, diff difference. Secondly, uh, it is quite true, as uh, Cengiz said, that uh, uh, an Islamic party in power, however, however moderate it is, like the AKP for the past uh, 13 years, is becoming or has become, for its own reasons, as authoritarian as the others before. Uh, so we, we have that, that issue, and uh, in a way, Tunisia in 2015 is like uh, 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 Turkey in 2002, 2003. Uh, you know, big expectations, these people are going to combine democracy and Islam, and then after a while you, you realize that it, it just doesn't work. Um, where, where I think we missed the turn in, in Turkey is that um, we sort of play the game, and especially the French president of the time, Sir Sarkozy, and perhaps uh, the government here at the same time, as if Turkey was about to enter the EU tomorrow which has never been the case. I mean, the, this uh, negotiation is highly conditional, it's quite conditional on its own conditionality, chapters and political criteria, but also on the approval, 30 different ratifications, including some by, by uh, referendum. So we were never around the corner for accession, nor was the Turkish government, by the way. Um, but the, the trip was more interesting than the goal. And because we raised, we, EU and some governments in particular, raised so many uh, obstacles all the time, Cyprus, France, others, uh, we failed to exert influence uh, on, on Turkey. Now we are in a more difficult situation because of several different developments, not just the Islamic objectives of uh, Mr. Erdogan, but also the anti-corruption uh, issue, the PKK issue, uh, ISIS, obviously, um, and, and we need to integrate, a diff and that's where I, I, I would agree with Michel, we need to integrate a new set of issues into our dealings with, with Turkey. I mean, refugees is something that they wanted to deal with for the past four years on their own, mistakes have been done. This is way bigger than Turkey. It's an international issue, and we have our own interest there. Uh, the Turkish ISIS border, this is now 250 kilometers long, and this is the gateway of ISIS to the world. We're not doing enough to you know, push our interest there. Oil is going to flow daily, entire convoys of tanker trucks uh, from uh, Syria into Turkey, not doing a thing about it. Uh, there's a bit of a better control now on foreign fighters coming from the EU, but basically they still come and go. Uh, so, and, and God knows what Turkey is going to be deciding in a few weeks, few months on the NATO defense, uh, missile defense shield. Uh, they may, you know, go on their own way, and that will create a huge gap in NATO's, NATO's defense. So, we need to be much more assertive. To be assertive with Turkey, we need to be in conversation with Turkey. And that includes accession, however remote, and a number of other things. Mark, uh, thank you very much. We have tossed a lot of stuff in front of you, um, uh, and uh, the now good it's thing up is to that you. The clock never moves here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, it's always twelve o'clock. I'm, I'm so glad it's not five it's minutes no before five twelve. Minutes to 12. Um, I, w I would like to um, do one round of three questions initially. We have about twenty minutes left before we have to conclude here. Um, and please raise your hand and indicate very clearly. Also, please make sure that you only have one question and not three or five. Um, and then also introduce yourself and identify ideally to whom the question uh, should go. I think this gentleman over here was number one. I saw an arm here on the left over here, and then another third one, you know, we'll get there when we come to it. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Khaled uh, Ambassador of Egypt. Um, congratulations on the discussion. Very good initiative. But you're discussing among yourselves. That's a European discussion on a neighborhood policy. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very good start, uh, but I think there is need to uh, have a structured dialogue with uh, the South. I'll confine myself to the s Southern uh, policy here. Um, so many things, um, a lot 
of food on the plate that you've presented to everybody here. No time to really go into the details of that. Just uh, a couple of, of comments. Uh, Mark Perini, you hit the point on the nail. It's about changing societies. And I agree fully with you on that. And you need to really look into that deep to understand the changes that are taking place there. And here I'm referring to the Islamists, wherever they are. Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, no, the EU does matter. Uh, when the, European, the Italian parliament uh, votes or take a decision, that is trickled down, that is known to the public, that's known not only to the Palestinians but across the Arab world. It does make a difference, the EU can make a difference here. So don't take out or discount the EU from uh, that uh, issue. Um, Gudrun, Dr. Harar, you know Egypt too well. And the point you raised, it's very true. It's also about perception. The perception of the action that you do. The perception of choosing sides. It's not about choosing sides. Uh, basically, it's about the engagement in dialogue to try to understand more. Many of the issues that have been raised here today, I have a gazillion responses and points to them. But that's, proposed, that's exactly the point I want to make, that you need to start a dialogue. Uh, I would have wished that dialogue to start even producing the green paper that uh, Commissioner uh, Han uh, referred to. And by, by the way, I think the points that he, he mentioned are quite important. It's about the partnership, it's about the dialogue. Uh, so I would suggest that uh, you start soon on this dialogue. Maybe you can uh, approach the Arab League and as one of the venues to start su such a dialogue, but also bilaterally with the states in the Thank you very the much, Thank you. Ambassador. Very important point taken. This gentleman over here, please, very briefly. Thank you very much. Rainer Stefan, my name. And um, I have no question I've, uh, on this statement uh, because um, I worked um, for many decades um, in the Eastern Partnership countries and for these countries. And so you asked um, one of your first questions was if um, the European uh, neighborhood policy failed. Yes, it failed because of two main reasons. One, what is US, uh, Europe aid doing? They are financing um, institutions, so-called institution building. And with that, you finance the corruption only. And if you think on Austrian history, we had the same institutions in the First Republic and the Second Republic. In the First Republic, it didn't work because we had not the consensus uh, we need for to make them um, active. And the same is in these countries. The people, the ruling people in these countries are all, nearly all, from the old regime, Soviet regime. So what they are interested in, to stay in power and to let the people on a certain low level, economically and social low level. What they don't want is to have a middle class because a middle class is proud about what they are doing and they would participate in, uh, in, in the policy also. And the second one is that uh, EU gives every year hundreds of millions of euros to the states, the member states of um, this Eastern Partnership, and then they let them decide um, only alone what to do with this money. And this is also what, um, what is not, um, not good because uh, it, it, uh, it finances also the corruption because they make some projects uh, in, in a relation of 80 to 20. 20 for the project, 80 for their own pockets. And this is it. So finally, this should be changed. Thank you very much. I, there's one more question here. That's the last one for this round. Uh, I just would like to ask about Libya. At the beginning, overthrowing Gaddafi, some European countries were quite active, but later on, not much happened. And uh, shouldn't we be uh, at least mediator and what about uh, the thoughts, uh, how to help in this situ situation? All right, okay, this, I think we have, we have gotten to the core with these three questions. Uh, is this a discussion amongst ourselves, primarily? The Europeans talking about the Arab world without the Arabs in the, world, in the place. Uh, what kind of structured dialogue can we start? You know, how can we actually change places when local uh, agency, when people, the, 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 the elites want to stay in power rather than reform? The question of conditionality, giving money, but then not asking anything in, in return. And then the question of Libya, after an intervention, how do you then actually, you know, once you've owned the place, 
and partially actually also broken the place, how do you actually then fix it? I guess we have lots of stuff here. Who wants to go first on this? Mark, perhaps, and then um, here, yeah, Kula, well, and then to the Egyptian ambassador, I, I would uh, say that back in uh, a, a younger time in my career, uh, in 95, we had the succession of France and Spain crafting the uh, Euromed partnership, if you remember, by having ministers and high officials touring the country and saying, well, these are our ideas, they're not official yet, what do you think? And there was a consensus at the time. And it worked rather well, I say that because I was the first Euromed coordinator, uh, until September 11. And then, of course, uh, a number of uh, leaders in the Arab world presented themselves as the biggest firewall, the best uh, protection against Islamism and etc. Uh, today, I would say that what is uh, left of all this period is that we have, in various ways in different countries, a, a, a strand of the society which is liberal, secularist, can be religious conservative but attached to uh, liberal values uh, and certainly to democratic elections and so on, and you have others with different goals. And therefore, what's needed first is a dialogue within each country. We've seen the very difficult transition in Egypt after the fall of uh, Mubarak. We've seen very difficult transition, perhaps less violent, of course, uh, in Tunisia. And we have uncertain situations like Morocco or Jordan, even. And we have the tragedy in, in Syria. Um, but where we can, I think the EU should uh, first, facilitate national dialogue, national consensus, and then branch out on this dialogue. Because we, we're not expected, as Europeans, to certainly not give lessons, give recipes, and so on. These revolutions happen largely without us. So trust the national dialogue, try to facilitate the national dialogue, and then bring solutions. Without, without, sorry, without being naive, uh, on Islamist parties. I have Michael Köhler on the list and then both Gudrun and Florence who want to say something about the Libya case. Yeah, I try to be very quick. Um, first, uh, Your Excellency, many, many thanks for your comments. Uh, first, I, I very much agree with you that uh, we should not l lose sight of the change in societies at large, not only in Egypt. Uh, I think we were very much aware of this changing society when the Arab Spring happened, so to say, because all these young people were taken to the streets using f uh, Twitter, Facebook, other social medias in order to convene. And now we have some sort of backlash in certain countries, and we, we are now kind of fascinated by the security agenda, fascinated also by the Islamist agenda, but we tend to lose sight of the uh, fact the society continues to change. Not only their mastership, so to say, of technical means, like the social media, but they are young generations, they have other expectations, and this inspires me personally with a lot of hope. There's going to be more than just more of the same, simply because People are more numerous and people have other expectations, and not only in Tunisia, also in the other countries. So uh, sometimes, looking at these historical uh, features and paintings here, I feel remembered, uh, remembered, so to say, as a historian that I'm uh, by training, of the year 1815, 1816, when after the Napoleonic Wars, restoration was back. And people like uh, uh, Louis XVIII uh, in, in France thought that, well, we are back to the good old times. In reality, Times were, had changed and societies had changed and the restoration that was then to come was only very short-lived. Already in 1830, there was a full change, so to say, not only in France but also in other countries. I'm sure we are going to say, see the same thing in the Arab world. And secondly, uh, Ambassador, <coughs> uh, if we go back to what the Commissioner told us in his introductory remarks, I think the more feature is that this reform or revision of neighborhood policy is not a top-down decree. And in that respect, it, it differs very much from the reforms in 2006 and 2011, because this policy has been reformed already twice. This time we don't call it a reform, we call it revision or review, and we have uh, construed it as a year-long process. Now, the year-long process is in order to reach out to people like yourselves. And the good news is that the Egyptian government, uh, middle of last week, was the first government of all neighborhood countries that came with their own submission, their own written text, with some proposals concerning the future construction of neighborhood policy. Secondly, on the 13th of April, uh, the EU has invited to Barcelona eight uh, Arab foreign ministers in order to have a full discussion on uh, neighborhood policy. 
Then we have discussed with Secretary General Al Arabi of the Arab League whether Mrs. Mogherini and Mr. Hahn could not attend the ministerial meeting of the Arab League in order to discuss EU Arab League uh, 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 relations in the future. And I also know that the government of Lebanon wants to host a, a workshop on uh, this kind of issues with other Arab countries in the Middle East and the European Union in the later course of this consultation process. So this is really a consultative process, and if after that neighborhood policy is not better than it was before, it's not only our fault, it's also going to be your fault, <laughs> because you were not courageous enough in your discussions. Yeah, I could just yeah. make a final word, because the gentleman yes, who, who spoke about uh, uh, corruption so eloquently, if you have a moment, please go out and give, bring me a big knife or a sword. Because I, as I am personally responsible for EU funds, not only in the southern, but also in the eastern neighborhood, <laughs> if you are halfway right, I would like to commit harakiri here on the public stage. <laughs> I, no, 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 we won't allow that. As, I, as, as Jan already characterized me as, as an optimist, uh, I think my vision of things is slightly more optimistic, and I would say, uh, just for the record here, that I utterly disagree with you. We only give we, you a very short that we give <laughs> That we give 80% of the money to Eastern countries and they do whatever they want with this, no. I mean, there are two things or two I could tell you about conditionality and also about fight of corruption. So give me some time before I commit Harakiri. <laughs> but I'm, I'm certainly not uh, standing back to admit that corruption is a problem in many of the countries, not only in the Eastern neighborhood, and therefore in all of the countries. We work very hard, for example, with the IMF, on uh, public uh, expenditure and accountancy review uh, schemes, on public procurement schemes, on new corruption, anti-corruption legislation. Let's not forget that the first law that was passed under Poroshenko in, uh, in Ukraine was a new anti-corruption legislation. This doesn't, come from, this doesn't fall from the sky. This was uh, a result of pressure from international finance institutions, including the European Union. I can see the I can see the headline in, in der Standard. EU official threatens suicide over apartment <laughs> policy. Um, the, the you're not, you're not right allowed here. to do this. Look, look at the calendar. We're not yeah. paying you for this. Um, uh, Gudrun, you wanted to say something about yeah. Libya. I mean, there are two points. Libya is really amazing. I mean, you know, in 2003, uh, we criticized the Europeans to go into Iraq without any uh, policy plan, without any plan for for the peace. No. And in, in, in 2011, we use a mandate given for the responsibility to protect, to topple a regime, more or less. Who's we? Who's we? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. But, but, I yeah. beg not yes. to be part of that. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but uh, okay, the, the, uh, Euro, uh, European countries were in the driver's seat. Let's put it Some that way. European Some countries. European countries were in the driver's seat and not the Americans at that time. No? And we wanted it, and, and uh, the, the, also the idea was, I mean, to protect Euro, Europe from refugees from um, Africa and so on. So, <coughs> and then just to leave and, and do nothing right, is really amazing. But for me, it's, it's even a more <laughs> a deeper, it, it raises a deeper question. Because the political processes which we, um, used to impose or to, to recommend for all these countries. I mean, we have to say now, after some years, they don't work. It started uh, in Iraq in 2005. The elections were quite good elections, and they really produced the, comp the complete, uh, I mean, uh, diverse result from what we intended. And the same thing happened in Libya. No? The last escalation last year in Libya happened because of the elections. And so I think the, the problem runs very deeply. We have to think about these concepts. And I, I mean, we have to think if it's uh, just true to, to say, OK, uh, the recipe for healing a society, a uh, political situation, is to send uh, people to, to elect. I mean, we have to think more about how to uh, create uh, legitimacy, how to make uh, people, to make the losers accept that they did not win the elections. So I think <coughs> Libya is really a, a worth a case study for this problem. Good one. Thank you very much. I want to give it to Florence now also on Libya, but then I would like to ask Cengiz to already prepare famous last words, because you'll be the last one speaking here. Okay. I have to give it to you. <laughs> We've exhausted our time, and we have to come to a conclusion. Florence. Well, I think Libya is a, a tragic crash of two trains that left one in Baghdad and one in Tripoli at a time when they shouldn't have crashed. So I, I'd be a little bit 
I, I share uh, Gudrun Hara's frustration, but I think I see institutionally, I see it a bit more nuanced than just saying we had no idea. Um, what happened in 2011 was, if you remember at the time, there was the big financial crisis. Uh, those countries that were involved actively in Libya had just overlearned the <coughs> Iraq-Afghanistan lessons, which were, if you go, you know, under no circumstances go and send troops into a country uh, and so forth. So there was this very strong desire to stay out of it as much as possible and not just by neglect, but because there was also the reaction, uh, well, for, from the countries themselves, the regional countries and from Libya also, to have no intervention whatsoever. In August 2011, um, a paper from the United Nations was leaked suggesting sending a small military observer mission, not even peacekeeping, but a small observer mission. And the NTC, the Libyan National Transitional Council, which, speaking of legitimacy, had no legitimacy whatsoever, um, uh, went very high and mighty on all the media and said, we want no one on the ground, we can totally do this alone. So while I agree that we shouldn't have listened to that, we get, there was also a very strong Libyan pushback on any, uh, any interference. The second train that I mentioned that crashed was that under Gaddafi, first of all, there was very little uh, research to go into the country as academics. Research is extremely difficult. So when the war broke out, there was virtually maybe two or three people who actually knew what the situation was like and what would we find actually after Gaddafi left. Um, we already suspected that there was very little institutional uh, well, ruins to build on, but the extent which must, were, was much bigger. And then the key t two um, mistakes were made very, very early. Uh, first of all, uh, given, this, given that police and armed forces had melted away, give the security responsibility to the militias, always a bad idea. And uh, secondly, um, to, well, a little later, the, the, the whole question of who's actually allowed to take part in the new Libya, the political isolation law, the de-gadification law, we allowed it actually to come into being in 2013. For me, what's going on today is, is a combination of these two, but it's very much a struggle of the two old forces, well, the old forces against the new forces. If you look closely, who's behind the governments in Tripoli and in Tobruk, it's not Islamist versus secular. Believe me, there is not a single secular person in Libya. It is uh, behind, between those who are affected massively, uh, affected massively by this degatification law and those that are the new forces and they want to drive Libya to a different place. So um, you said earlier it's not about Islamism, it's about different things. So we have two largely Libya-driven developments, but we ha we've had our share. That goes without saying. We should simply, in the summer of 2011, Given the financial crisis, given the, the lessons from Iraq, we should have t listened to the fact that you cannot give security to 18-year-old boys with guns. So, lots, of, lots, of, lots of lessons to be learned from that case alone. Um, you will now sum it up for us and provide the solutions, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try my best. No, I'd, I'd like to respond to what uh, the ambassador said. I don't uh, think that Europe doesn't matter. I just think looking back, it, uh, European policies didn't really diverge from US policies in, in, like in big style, let's say. But there are, of course, chances. And I think that uh, the, the Israeli government is doing a lot of harm to uh, any friends of Israel uh, abroad uh, with its policies of, uh, of also radicalizing the, the, the discourse somehow. Um, it is such a big issue. I have no answers to how to how to approach the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, um, but I think Europe could play a role definitely. And uh, and coming uh, back to the European neighbourhood policy, I think um, uh, that um, one of the things I mentioned also earlier, it is really important to be humble when we and and uh, when we when we approach the region. Uh, it is. We shouldn't set our um, goals too high. Uh, it is an illusion to, that the European Union could transform its whole neighborhood um, and without giving any uh, rewards, like uh, membership, for instance. That was actually the biggest transform transformative tool the European Union has had so far, and it couldn't really develop anything uh, similar to it. And we should be also aware that the European neighborhood policies always go hand in hand with neoliberal 
uh, economic policies. It is very much about liberalizing trade and enforcing uh, the countries there to implement neoliberal programs. So it is what the European Union is defending is usually not that far away from, from what the IMF and the World Bank suggest as solutions. But we see that these recipes are also facing some troubles. If you look at, at, at Tunisia, just before the revolution took place, it had fabulous uh, rates, you know, um, uh, Tunisia was doing extremely well on the paper. The problem is that people couldn't find jobs, young people couldn't find jobs and all that. Um, and and uh, that brings me to another thing. I think it is mainly this youth bulge, which is uh, a big uh, problem in the region. There's so many, talking about Tunisia, there's so many young people, educated young people, who just don't have any uh, job perspectives. And, uh, and if you look on a global hierarchy, Key where a Tunisian university student, student is ranked, it is somewhere very below. So I think what we should do is enforcing uh, programs um, uh, together with uh, universities in the region and these kind of things just also to, to help people there to have a chance on a global labor market. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I guess we have now reached the point where the real juices start to flow in this discussion mm -hmm. and where we would have to actually sit down uh, and, 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 and dig a bit deeper. But unfortunately, as it always is the case with these kinds of events, this is exactly when we need to stop. Um, uh, thank you very much to all of my panelists here. We've covered so much ground and you've been all very brave and you've all followed the rules of you know, brevity and, and conciseness, which is great. Um, and uh, uh, one final uh, quick announcement, we will do a, 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 a tea or coffee break now, uh, 15 minutes outside this room. Uh, please come back here, there will be you know, uh, people enforcing that law as well. <laughs> um, and more importantly, the panelists of the next panel, please meet outside the room, you will be picked up and you will be given these little brain devices here so that you can speak uh, uh, audibly for everybody. Um, just meet immediately going. now uh, outside okay. there. Thank you very much to all of you, and please give, lend me a hand for the, the panelists today.
privilege to be But where were you born? He was British and he was in Hong Kong. Yeah? Right. But it's, it's, it's so apart. Oh, okay. oh really? <coughs> Oh, I see. Oh, oh, so you're an imposter. You're a Swiss. I mean, when I when I so. when I grew up, everybody around was from university. Now they're all from uh, all from the city. So watch does not work. Yeah. <laughs> not so we're about to begin the second session. Is everybody in from the? the corridor we're about to start we're about to start yes everybody everybody wants to come in please come in and the clock still doesn't work <laughs> thank you okay so we're going to start the next session uh, Clearly, from, from the south, we go up to the <laughs> east or the northeast or central, but it's known as Eastern Europe. And uh, certainly, like the south, is very much in the news and it's linked to where the European Union's neighborhood policy is going to go, where it's going to stop, how it should develop. And um, it's an it's a, it's a expert panel, it's a big panel. Uh, we're not going to waste time. And um, I'm going to, um, the whole idea is to have sh um, short comments most of the time. Please intervene, uh, makes a very interesting um, discussion. And I would also like to open it up to, 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 um, to, the, to the floor. This is very important. This is your neighborhood, as the Austrians reminded us of, <coughs> that um, Ukraine is nearer to you than Switzerland. And it's good to be reminded of this. I wonder, does it explain your, your policy towards Russia? But we will touch Russia as well, no doubt. Any case, great to have you welcome here. And I think um, I'm going to take uh, from, I'm going to start very quickly, just in, by way of introduction, allowing you just to uh, deal with my very short question. And very nice to have you, um, Werner Almhofer, Deputy, Deputy Director General for EU Coordination and Global Economic Governance, as if that wasn't enough. Federal Ministry for Europe, Integration and Foreign Affairs, well, welcome. Very, very, it's a detailed question, but nevertheless, I'm sure you've thought about it a long time. Ukraine, and we're not, we don't want to focus on Ukraine the whole time, but it has to be our starting point. It's hard to know what will happen to Minsk too. But has, has, what, has the Ukraine crisis damaged the European neighborhood policy or actually been a, a real impetus for the EU, the Commission of Member States to actually really focus on creating a new neighborhood policy for the region. Big the Adam and readers of Carnegie Papers would know that Stefan Lehne issued his paper at a stage when we wouldn't see what would be following last year, which yep. would mean that, that, that it was sufficiently damaged for analysts and, and, and other political pundits, but maybe uh, not for the broader public. Uh, so insofar, I think the, uh, your question is right. I think it's more or less the, the focal point of something that may have been going wrong. And, 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 if, and, and we heard criticism earlier in the debate and since, since the, the opening statements by the Minister and Commissioner Hahn and then Jan Dechel, if, 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 if the, the common thinking in the box is more or less, that it's, it's presumably too bureaucratic, maybe a little bit resembling too, this, this ENP too, too much to enlargement policies and do we really then offer a European perspective and so on and so forth. This is now the, the greatest trigger in the Eastern Front, you're right, in the Eastern uh, neighborhood policy, the Ukraine question is, is, is the number one question for the policy currently. Yeah, yes, but you haven't quite answered the question. I mean, <laughs> it, it, of course we all know it's the number one question, but you know, in the mindset when you're sitting in Vienna, I mean, has, in what way has the Ukraine crisis and its ongoing, what way has it changed the perception inside Europe of this neighborhood policy? Uh, I think it did, because the, 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 as, as I said, a year ago, and maybe around Vilnius, people may not have been that convinced that it was a failure. Maybe one would hope, be hoping in Vilnius, okay, Mr. President Yanukovych, you, you, you sign a little bit later. This was more or less the, 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 the uh, and next time we hope to have you on board or something like that. So we had two, two, two signatures there and, and one country that, uh, that stepped out. So this was a, a few months before the crisis, uh, uh, really uh, the Maidan started and, and, and had the successful results it had. 
So the, 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 polit the common, even among political leaders, the common vision in, in Vilnius still was, okay, this, this is a delaying a, a effect, what we have there, uh, but it's not a failure of our policies. And since then, we see a thing of change. Not a uh, uh, Niels Janssen, thank you for coming. Eastern Partnership, Regional Cooperation, OSC as well. Um, I've just come from there this morning. Um, and the European, European uh, External Action Service. Can you pick up on this? I mean, this, this, the, the Ukraine is just so complex and so fundamental to European security now, given what is happening there. But I mean, uh, what, what, how do we adapt our policies if we do even have a long-term policy towards Ukraine? Com complexity is the word. I think. Uh, I think what it's it's not the failure uh, as such. I think. I think what we've seen out of the out of the uh, crisis in Ukraine that uh, that uh, that our approach to the region uh, uh, or or the issues in the region are much more complex than we thought they were. So our approach also needs to be, you know, uh, somewhat better thought through, and therefore, you know, uh, the whole the whole you know the implications for the review that uh, that the commissioner uh, uh, spoke about. But but you, Ukraine crisis obviously is not the only significant element uh, of the background for the for the Riga summit that we will have in a, in, a, in a few months' time. Huh? Not, uh, aside from the crisis, we have a very very important development. Maybe you want to come to it later yes. uh, of of the association agreements and and and, and deep and, uh, um, deep and comprehensive free trade area coming into force for three. Uh, three of our partner countries, and 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 then uh, uh, this is of a profound uh, significance uh, for also for one of the aspects of, uh, that we want to tackle in the review, which is the differentiation. Well, uh, uh, yes, and we should be optimistic and looking forward to Riga, especially since we have Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine having signed the the AA. But I mean, look what's happening in Moldova now, not only backpedaling with a minority government, the new designated <coughs> prime minister is 35 years old, no experience in politics, we have a problem in Georgia as well. I mean, has the, the, the accords on the sine qua non of, of, this, uh, of this neighborhood policy, uh, do you, do, uh, Alain Delacroix, do you worry about now not being able to use the momentum, exploit what, what happened in Vilnius when, uh, when um, Georgia and Moldova and indeed later Ukraine signed the association accords, that we're not following it through? Well, I think there is a real danger for not seizing the, the momentum, but what I find important is that, in my mind, the lessons that the EU has driven from Ukraine is that before Ukraine, the ENP was designed as a typical European policy. That is, economics, we pretend to do only economics, but at the end of the day, we are demanding deep political changes, and nobody is driving the political agenda. We have, you know, the different uh, directorates of the Commission going in there, giving <clears throat> the money, doing the reports, but you have no political driver in the, in the seat. Now the drivers are there from the European side, I mean. But the drivers are not in Brussels. This is what I find, in a way, uh, not very positive for the future, because I think this has to be Brusselized. We see that we are in a very dangerous situation in the continent, that war is back on this continent, that, that bad blood is flowing across the continent, very dangerous bad blood. and. Instead of having Brussels driving this process, we have basically three countries to make it sure. That, mm. is, that is the, the Weimar Triangle in a way, or let's say, or even two, you know, mm. France and, and Germany. And uh, I, see, I see a problem there, because for these two countries in particular, there are two big issues, Ukraine and Russia. Uh -huh. And when you start speaking about Georgia and uh, Moldova, this is, in my views, I might be wrong, but uh, when you go to Paris and Berlin, it's not, it's not the first thing you hear on their agenda. Well, you, you've opened up a, cat of, a, what do you call it, a can of worms here, because in fact, I'm not so sure the EU wants to be involved in the Ukraine crisis, leaving aside the United States. That's a different issue. I wonder about, um, you say that the driving forces, Gwen, there is actually a fundamentally new driving force, especially in Ukraine, it's the Medan. I mean, this is something new. I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is the, the um, momentum. This is pushing. This is the, the pushing the reforms. How significant is this, uh, Gwen, for completing this part of Ukraine's revolution? I think it's very significant. If I can add one yes. thing um, that came out of the discussion so far already, um, I think the EU is actually in a very uncomfortable position, and it's not only about realizing that the ENP 
um, is ineffective um, or that it maintains a certain status quo. The Ukraine crisis has shown that it also becomes part of political dynamics, which can escalate, and it's part of unintended consequences, perhaps. But the EU is part of the beginning of the escalation that we've seen inside Ukraine and also with a wider geopolitical context. So I think there are very uncomfortable lessons that need to be learned still, and I'm not sure um, inside the EU um, we're that good at learning them yet. Because by um, keeping parts of policy vague, by uh, raising expectations and hopes, I think um, the EU is, is part of the dynamics we, we have seen, and I think that's a very uncomfortable starting point. But on your, on your other question about driving forces, I think you're absolutely right. Um, here's a case where um, we actually see civil society. Um, we normally look for particular organizations or Western actors, try to set them up, and then they're not really civil society. Um, here is a movement that is growing out of something quite amorphous. I mean, the problem immediately is it's not a very well organized political force. It didn't start like that. It started over the, um, an interesting starting point in a way for, for um, mass mobilization, not signing an association agreement uh, or a foreign policy issue in a way. But clearly behind that are very, uh, sort of uh, broader aspirations to have the same living standards as, as, as Europe and to, to aspire to some of that rather than maybe the minutiae of, of mm. EU membership or association mm. with the EU. In Indeed, and also the whole idea of, 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 the, of the, the civil rights and the human rights, of, of the society, building the society, having a stake in it. Um, um, I want, James Ruff, I know you, you deal more, a lot with, uh, actually you deal with economics <laughs> all the time, but are you, I mean, having, looking at Moldova and Ukraine, and I'm sure you're very closely involved there, and I'd like to touch on Belarus later, are you, um, are you comfortable now with the kind of cooperation between the EU, the IMF, and what's taking place among mm -hmm. the emerging political elites or the new status quo, particularly in Ukraine? Well, I think, I think the, uh, you know, the, the lesson in Ukraine is, is one that we knew already, which, which is that, the, you know, that reform does come from within. It can't be driven from outside. And, and uh, you know, we've had, we've had uh, programs with Ukraine over the years, many times running into the sand, uh, despite great hopes sometimes uh, that, that we would you know, finally turn the corner there. Um, and, uh, of course, you, know, you can't impose this kind of reform from the outside, whether it's the IMF uh, trying to push with, with money uh, or the, whether it's the EU um, through, through political means. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the Maidan has shown that now, you know, there is this impetus for reform coming mm -hmm. from within, which we can, all, we, we can all support. Of course, they're in the most difficult situation that they've been for all these years. So now we have, you know, we have in the past, we had an easier situation, but a lack mm -hmm. of, lack of uh, political momentum from, from within. Now we have the political momentum within, but in this, in this extremely difficult uh, circumstances with, with risks on all sides. But I, I think so, you know, that is, a, that is the, the positive side coming out from that. But I think it's, it's a lesson that we, we knew already, really, that, you know, it, it's, not, it's not the neighborhood policy, it's not the, um, it's not the IMF conditionality that's going to make uh, countries like this, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, all these countries. It's not, it's not the outside pressure that's going to really turn the corner so, for them. So, for instance, if you just slightly move away from Ukraine and look at Moldova, the signing of the, the association accord for, uh, with Kishinev, it hasn't, it hasn't kicked off the reforms yet. Mm. Are, you saying, are you saying this is because the elites are so entrenched there that they don't want to uh, give up the kind of vested interest. What, what is it that's that's holding up Moldova, leaving yeah. aside Transnistria? Yeah. So, so Moldova, I'm, I, I have not a great deal of expertise on, but I mean, that's uh, my impression is that you know, in these cases where uh, you know it's like you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. Um, mm. You know, the the uh, um, we have the same situation in in, in Belarus in a yeah. in a quite different uh, different different circumstances, but the same the same story that you you know you you can't. Um, as I was saying, create these um, changes from outside, and, and it's it's not even just a matter of signing documents because the yes. the, uh, the the reforms have to go so deeply through through the societies and through the governments to, that that when you have a lot of vested interests against them, I think it's very difficult to to uh, be sure that it's going to succeed. Niels, just just yeah, to please. add a word on yes. Moldova, um, of course we were in a situation where uh, where the elections were, were taking place, and after the elections, well, they had a bit of a difficulty in forming the, the new government. Uh, so, so in that situation, I mean, if you sort of stand by them with a, with a watch and say, you know, how about the reforms? Uh, of course, you know, let, let the government to be formed. And, then, and, and, and now I think is the time when, 
when we are uh, talking to the new government and, and seeing how they take uh, how they take uh, the, uh, the, the the required reforms forward, you know, because the association agreements that we have with the three countries they are basically uh, a, a sort of a broad program of, of of reforms across the whole spectrum of the of the government. When you economy. say we, do you mean Brussels? Do you mean Riga? Do you mean Berlin? I, well, I mean the EU. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, but I mean who? I mean we touched on it just briefly. I mean who's the driving? Who's who's in the driving seat when it comes to the Eastern neighbourhood policy? That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> but he cannot. Your basic question to answer. <laughs> look, he look, has it's, to say it's, it's the been, um, in a way, uh, you know, one answer to to give you. From my, from my side, I mean, this is a process which has been driven uh, by, uh, by Brussels, the, the negotiations of the association agreement. But of course, but of course, like with all the policies that, uh, that we have, it is important that we act in concert with the, uh, with the member states and we have a good level of understanding and agreement, which we, which we try to achieve by, by discussing regularly at the, at the, at the council bodies. Yeah, maybe to put a bit more explicit, and since there was this re reference to the 500 kilometers distance, which is not from the Austrian border to Switzerland, but from Vienna to Switzerland, and from Vienna eastwards, <laughs> this is the, the Ukraine, say, in here in Vienna. But there is, uh, there is ge geography exists. We had it also in the, in the first panel. So logically, maybe some Scandinavian countries, and, and, and even some countries like Central European countries, might be less interested in the southern neighborhood yes. policy. And, and then others in, in the eastern neighborhood. And, and, and so logically, there is a bit of, not, I wouldn't say east-west divide, but maybe an east-west uh, divide in, in commitment in the day-to-day -day work and so on. So for example, the EMP has a lot of seminars with this administration, people from the respective countries on, I don't know, public administration reform and so on. And if you look who is then the panelist, it's, it's maybe people coming from two or three or four countries. And it's predominantly east of Vienna, east of Berlin, definitely east of Brussels. Uh, yes, I mean, geography does play a role, but we could get into the role of, of the Baltic states and Poland and perhaps Germany in, in helping these groups of countries and maybe there should be the division of labour with the south. But uh, moving into Riga, though, I mean, the Latvians want Riga to be a success. I mean, this is their showcase. And the expert, I mean, we've learned a great deal about the, the Vilnius. Uh, some could say it was a, it was a catastrophe. Other, others would say, no, it was a success. But what can Riga really deliver? Or can they deliver anything? Well, it, uh, if I can start no, off. Go, no. Go, go. no, please. No, go. Oh, you well, well, I think, first of all, coming back to what Gwendolyn said and what you said on Moldova, is that the EU can deliver what its nations want, first of all. I think we've heard, and James has repeated it, we heard on the first panel already, imposing changes from outside is so difficult. Look at the EU when we're speaking about reforms in Moldova. Within the EU, take the list of countries, starting from mine, not to speak about Greece, France, which cannot reform themselves. We are ourselves in a deep crisis, a deep crisis of belief towards the EU from our own citizens. So I think the big thing with Maidan that Maidan has revigorated not only the Ukrainians, but the, U the EU per se. You know, we, we keep saying this is the only place in the world where someone has died with an, uh, an EU flag in his hands, right? But so I, I think this is the point for me in prioritizing where the new ENP will go. And the priorities will be to go, but strongly, not, not just giving bunches of money here and there strongly with those who move. And I believe Ukraine is one of these countries which is meaning business now. If you look at all the new legislation that came out since, uh, since the elections, they are, quite, quite in, they are doing exactly what Poland has been doing, actually. So we should be there as a priority. Moldova, after the elect elections, will move away. OK, we are not an, imp an imperialistic power, the EU. They move away, they move away. We have enough problems with others. Sorry, well, I'm being a well, little bit it's, problematic. It's, it's, it, I, I, were it so simple as that? Because remember, we have a new Romanian president who's taking Moldova very, very seriously. And the dynamics between uh, Bucharest and, and Chisinau will, will change. Uh, Gwen, you wanted to come in here. Yes, <clears throat> I think Riga has to strike a very difficult balance. Um, and it might actually be problematic to some extent that it's happening in Riga, this, this summit. But I think um, one important element is to stress that association agreements still mean something, and they are legal documents, so it has to, cooperation has to continue on that basis. 
But at the same time, um, I don't think it's realistic to expect that there could be an overhaul of the neighborhood policy by then. So rather than presenting something like a big new stage of the neighborhood policy, it would actually be a very courageous but difficult thing perhaps to do um, to say, let's, let's stop and think again um, and maybe pick up some issues that need to be addressed, like we, we talked in the previous panel already about anti-corruption initiatives, things that come partly out of the Ukrainian case, hold elsewhere, so that we slightly sidestep redesigning the entire mm. policy, but move one step towards these bilateral links with the very different countries in this neighborhood and pick issue areas where we can move forward. Yeah, but, let me pick, yes, you want to come in there. No, I just wanted to follow up on what Alain was saying about uh, money following reforms, if you like, or, um, because to me, I mean, one of the issues here is the, the, the amount of money on the table. I mean, if you look at uh, the Ukraine, uh, the new IMF program there is $17 billion. We, we already dispersed quite a lot last year. And there's really, you know, the, the money from, uh, from Europe is very, very small compared to that. Um, so I think, you know, if, you do, if, if, if Europe does want to have a, a, a bigger effect on these countries, um, I, think, I think, you know, more money uh, is, 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 is part of it. If you see the, the amount of money that's going into lots of things in Europe, you know, it seems to me that there's, uh, um, you know, perhaps I'm being naive here, but, but um, uh, this, is an important, this ought to be an important priority for Europe. It, it, James, it is, but it's all very well uh, putting, uh, putting aside lots of money. It's a question of absorbing uh, this money as well. And we know that the, Greeks, uh, the Greek government, uh, successive governments, had very great difficulties in absorbing the structural funds and the development funds. You wanted to come in, uh, yes. Just a word on the, on the Riga summit. I think because of the Ukraine events, it is very important that the leaders come together and reinform the EU's commitment to, to, to the policy uh, of the Eastern Partnership. Uh, and, and the other reason why it is important is because with three of our partners, we have a, a new, much higher level of relationship because of the association agreements, whereas with the other three, we're, uh, we're not there. So, so the challenge and what we, what we need to do in, in, in Riga is to demonstrate that the partnership uh, with this differentiation remains equally uh, relevant to both those with, with the association agreement as to those uh, mm -hmm. which don't don't have their surgery. and and uh, it's not it's not just a sort of a, uh, there is a logic why why it is um, um, uh, appealing and relevant also for those without the association agreement because because you know it may may have been that they don't feel uh, that they did not feel that easy you know in the in the face of the you know high level of the expectation mm -hmm. you know that that the association agreements would have put on them whereas. Uh, whereas we can find a, a certain level of accommodation with, with these countries that, that on, on, on a lower scale that, uh, that would make the partnership you know, more, uh, more appealing and important, significant for them as well. This is, this is really important because it begs the question, um, and I have to follow you up on this, what do we do then about Belarus? Well, with, we, we I mean, the state structures are intact. I mean, it gets, it's, it's a very special country um, from all accounts uh, and uh, analysts who write about it. Uh, the corruption is, is not high. It's at a minimal. It's functioning. Well, we need to be, we need to, we need to a certain level of patience, you know. We, we, we oh, can't, strategic we cannot, patience, <laughs> strategic patience, yes. <laughs> we need a certain level of patience and we have to, we, 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 we're discussing with, with, with Belarus whether there are, uh, as, uh, you know, certain small steps how we could deepen our critical engagement. We're in a critical engagement, so it's very critical mm -hmm. the way by which we engage with, with, with Belarus. But, but, but we, uh, we're trying to see whether we can, we can uh, do a little bit more, but that of course requires in the first place the Bel uh, Belarusians to do more on a certain issues which they know very well, we all know very well, uh, political prisoners, uh, just, to, just to bring the, 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 the heaviest in, in forefront. Which is a, a very difficult. James, you wanted to come in here, you know well, Belarus, Belarus very Bel well. Belarus is kind of, yeah, I travel there every six weeks or so, so yes. I, I know the country very well. And I, I agree, I think it's really a matter of dialogue because um, you know, the, the, from an economic perspective, you know, the model they've chosen is, is really, it's, it's hard to overstate how different it is from from uh, any other country in, in, in the region. Um, and it uh, basically has chosen to live on this, this uh, living off Russian subsidies effectively in, in one way or another. Um, and I think the, 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 you know, the ability to really make a fundamental change there is gonna be slow. I think you have to be patient. 
Uh, but what I find is that, as you say, the, the level of um, competence among officials, the level of corruption, does you know, is not cripplingly high. Um, and I think people are very responsible. We have an extremely good dialogue with them, um, and I'm sure the, the uh, EU, EU does as well. Um, so I think just continuing this dialogue is the best, is the best way to, to move forward. It, it, you know, for, from our point of view, it wouldn't help to be sort of throwing money at, at mm. uh, again if there's not the reform there. Uh, in, in practical terms, I mean, but we still have to go back to the uh, to dealing with the question. In practical terms, given that we don't want to raise the bar so high, given that we've learned from Vilnius, mm -hmm. given we've seen the uh, enormous uh, complexities of, of, the tran of, of Ukraine, which is going through a transformation, and it's, 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 it's only beginning, what realistically can be put on the table at Riga, which will be acceptable particularly to the member states? No, uh, let, 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 let's see this in the in, in, in the perspective. I mean, there, I think it's more about the political messaging that the summit, the message that the summit sends uh, regarding the our our eastern partnership uh, policy, the message of uh, uh, of the partnership being uh, being strong, also with the new differentiation that uh, that we have, and uh, the partnership offering. Uh, Attractive proposition to to all to all countries uh, involved against the Ukraine uh, events. It's not it's not that little. I uh, I would say there there of course will be you know certain sort of lower level you know range of range of deliverables of uh, of, of 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 things that 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 will be moved forward across the areas of uh, of of our cooperation and and you know th th we we cooperate uh, as 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 we know uh, across the wide uh, range of uh, areas uh, starting from the interconnectivity in transport and, and energy to to uh, mobility and people uh, to let people me, let me and etc et actually because you know the baltic states have have been stellar in the in the electricity interconnections and in other areas of cooperation <laughs> i mean sh shouldn't riga in fact be focusing, be focusing on one question, energy security. That the, 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 and we've seen huge uh, squabbles between some of the Baltic states on this issue. Instead of raising the expectations, practical, uh, I hate to use the word facts on the ground, but practical facts on the ground in terms of, for instance, energy security. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be one way of, of, the, of bringing them closer to, to the EU? Well, there is actually if, yeah, you, you know, just, just, just very quickly, yeah. uh, th there are there are new developments in in, in, in that area in Caucasus in in terms of the new electricity interconnections. Uh, there are uh, in in Moldova uh, in terms of the gas uh, pipeline between uh, Romania and Moldova. There are uh, there are uh, new developments, but I wouldn't I wouldn't make that the issue. Uh, I, you know, that's okay. one of the things in the range of the issues where we are moving forward with our partners. The partnership has not failed in that sense. Our cooperation is being is moving forward. On, on, on this, uh, uh, Gwen, did you want to say? On, on, I was wondering. The, the, the first panel was very interesting, and when I was covering the Middle East, uh, I was <coughs> covering the Barcelona process, and you know, year after year, the same problem. Uh, the, the, there was no regional cooperation. Um, wearing your IMF hat, I mean, do you see prospects for much closer regional cooperation, not just between the EU and individual um, Eastern European countries, but within the region itself, leaving aside what Russia's uh, intentions are? Uh, I mean, certainly this has been, I mean, thinking from a trade and investment point of view, this has been a surprise to me coming when I moved to the region a couple of years ago. Um, I was expecting much more, um, to see much more cooperation, discussion, um, and, and trade investment within Central Eastern Europe as a whole, within the Balkans, within between, uh, mm. uh, between them and the, the, uh, the, the partnership countries. And, and uh, instead, everybody's focus is towards, towards Western Europe. And, and I think that's, um, you know, it's a shame, but it's also an opportunity because I think, uh, you know, as, as these trade links are built, hopefully this will be an engine of growth going forward. But uh, it, it doesn't seem to be moving very quickly, I agree. Can I, can I, I bet you're saving your fire mm -hmm. when we discuss uh, Russia. I would like to ask you just a, a kind of more um, highly charged question about uh, Riga. Um, do, 
since the Ukraine crisis, I mean, there's been this language, there's been this idea that what's happening now is a competition, a competition for influence between the EU and Russia over this part of Europe, over Eastern Europe. Is that how the Austrians see it? I think it's not only what, how the Austrians see it, maybe, but the, the, the common com, uh, competition exists, and I guess the some of the some of the means that one competitive one competing partner is using we, we would rather not like to be see to be used insofar as it's a, a bit of an unfair competition insofar I would also defend our dear Niels in, in first trying to, to, to um, say, make a, a, an entire list of possible deliverables or, or, or things we have so to say the technocrat part of, of the EU is indeed delivering even when you wouldn't believe that they are. And the, the political debate, I guess, in Riga would very much be on the one side, who is the, first there was an elephant in the room in the, in the southern neighborhood, who would then be the United States. Here it's definitely a, an eastern neighbor to the eastern neighborhood, as an what, as elephant or whatever. And, and, and the, the, the ways how, how, how to cope with it. And, and, and since we talked so much about the need for differentiation, the Riga is still the highest level political format to discuss such issues. Mm. So this is heads of state and government level. So I, I would see if, if, if a more serious or more uh, maybe open debate on, on, on possibilities among a group of six countries talking to the European Union that was not homogeneous 10 years either. There may have been more, more felicitous circumstances in, mm. the, in the geopolitical neighborhood. Mm. But let's say that the, 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 the Belarusian have been, have been approached by, by Russia for also joining their wonderful uh, trade union in, 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 in uh, a few years ago. And, and, and this was years before uh, Armenia there to, to, to jump off the train. So, uh, mm. Gwen, you wanted to come in quickly. Yeah, um, I think at the moment the reality looks like a competition. Um, and that's in part, in part due to the fact that uh, the neighborhood policy is modeled on the accession process um, and is very linear. And even if there is not much progress, reports always say, well, there's a little bit of progress in the right direction. Um, and so that's not very helpful. And also the conflation between the EU and NATO is not very helpful in the, in the eastern neighborhood, and that's clearly happened. So I think um, uh, if Riga can achieve something, then it would be in addition to kind of sending a message that you were talking about, um, to open it up to uh, different kinds of interactions. And it brings Belarus and it brings Russia in different dialogues. We're not talking membership. Mm. We're talking very pragmatic, but perhaps meaningful um, cooperation on a number of issues. This doesn't mean giving up um, EU norms, values, whatever they are exactly. Uh, but maybe um, scaling down is actually the more yes. ambitious and, and courageous thing to do at this point. Yes, that was a point raised in the first session, like scaling down, limiting, I mean, who, which, which, who wants to read a thousand pages of, of the AA and the association the call for Ukraine was nearly a thousand maybe pages. Maybe then that notion of competition doesn't yes. come, come into it so strongly as well. Yeah, but I would disagree with that. I think we are in a competition and the competition doesn't come so much from the EU. That was when Ukraine happened in deep internal crisis. Everybody was suddenly surprised to see young Europeans out there with the Euro European flag and everybody ran into Kiev and nobody ran into Moscow. But the competition comes from a man, Mr. Putin, who has been proposing a competitive model of development for the continent to what the EU is proposing. And let, let us be clear. The EU is basically the biggest bloc of democracies in the world. Mr. Putin's Eurasian Union is a union of autocratic regimes. So on one hand, the countries that are in between have the choice between this and the autocratic uh, Eurasian Union. And when you ask the people and when they are informed, well, we've seen in Ukraine where their heart is and where their mind are. I mean, if you ask mm -hmm. you and me, I'm sure you can choose pretty quickly. Just to, clarify, I, I see, I, just to clarify, I see that there is competition at the moment, but I think the task is to think of ways out of something that gets so kind of stylized into, into a competition. Yes. So I was more thinking about ways out of that scenario rather than disputing it exists at the moment. I fully agree with that, but I think to, to develop a good set of politics, of policies, we have to have the right analysis. And I'm so surprised in our member states to see how many politicians say, no, Russia is not the enemy of Ukraine, Russia is not our enemy, Russia is nice, we have to be friends with them. No, Russia mm -hmm. is not nice right now. Russia has changed in 2014, and the, if our governments here do not recognize that, then we will set up again mistaken policies, and we will be in bigger troubles five years down the road. I, 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 
I'm going to throw this out to the audience in three minutes. I, I want to raise an issue, um, and it's been, I, I found it very interesting. Um, Gwen talked about maybe small steps, little things. I mean, small te steps actually can be very big steps, like visa arrangements, the right to travel, student exchanges. We mustn't underestimate uh, be, uh, the, the Schengen area. And I, I think there's been a change in Romania, may it last, may it continue rather, that precisely because people could travel, they saw what the West was like, and, and uh, uh, somebody living in the West, we were always so quick to criticize ourselves and denigrate the West. But this, uh, you know, you know exactly how, how Johannes was elected. Um, the number of young people and old people working inside the EU saw that change was possible, and they weren't be, to be beholden to, to cynical uh, politicians. So my question is this. These small steps, can Riga offer small steps, visa liberalization, small things that would mean a lot to these countries? Some of them have them already. Just to, just to note that with one of the, our six partners, with Moldova, we already have a yes, visa-free yes. regime, which is, a very, very, which, which is a step that has happened in, yes. in a way, running up to Riga already last yeah. April. Uh, uh, we have, we have a, a, a very uh, intensive dialogue with Georgia and, uh, and, and Ukraine on the um, uh, visa liberalization action plan. But, uh, but we also need to, we, we need to respect that it is a kind of technocratic process where we cannot leap over you know, certain, certain uh, requirements. So we have to, we have to let the, the Commission uh, uh, conduct the assessments thoroughly and make sure that all the benchmarks are, 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 are met before decisions are made. Never, but, but this is what we try to do. You know what, this, this is, is very, what we try to move is, forward. This is very interesting <laughs> because, because life is full of exceptions. And whatever you say about Putin, the Kalinin border crossing has not been closed. With Poland, and this was a, a Merkel uh, Lavrov. He didn't know very. Excuse me. Uh, this was between Merkel and um, the Polish president and the Commission. Uh, 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 this was uh, extraordinary change, and that ha that has been left intact. The fact that this border crossing can be opened, which means that exceptions can be made, can be negotiated with the Commission, which is very important when it comes to come up, come, comes up to the Riga summit. I mean, I'm not so sure Russia would dare close the border now because there's an awful lot of um, money being made over the border. But I'm just saying that the, the prospect of travel, the prospect of studying, the prospect of working in the EU is just, it doesn't cost that much, despite what David Cameron would believe. It's just an extraordinary change. I'm going to open the, the, the floor now to the audience. Firstly, and I really mean this, one question, and please identify yourselves. You'll have a chance for a second round. I'll take groups of three questions. <clears throat> so, yes, please. Mike. Mike, please. Mike, Mike. Mike, please. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Peter Havlik. I'm from oh, yes. the NI Institute for yes. International Economic Studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would have many questions, but I start with the first one. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a delayed implementation of deep and comprehensive free trade agreement mm -hmm. for the time being till the end of this year. Yes. The situation is very similar like uh, before Vilnius. Uh, my question now would be uh, how the European Union will proceed, how okay. these trilateral negotiations will, with Russia, Ukraine and EU will go on. Will something happen at Riga or before Riga or after? Thank you. Great question and um, I, this is the chance to thank you for all the help you gave me over the years when I used to talk to you. A second question, please. I thought there was going to be one over here. Second question. Okay, well, we can deal with this one. Yes, yes. Your name, please. Microphone, please. Valina Chakrova from Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy, based here in Vienna, because my question relates uh, to the question, to the first question. If we remember, um, the IMF, IMF uh, had uh, negotiations with uh, Ukraine uh, in 2013 on 10 billion uh, loan, which was then, so to say, was not given, and we know how the events then evolved. Um, I would like to know uh, how uh, is the internal discussion going on within the IMF. I mean, we have now 40 billion loan, which is uh, which has been confirmed to Ukraine for the years to come. Is it 
uh, I mean, was it a strategic mistake to not give the loan in 2013? Now you have, uh, I mean, four times more, and we still don't know whether these 40 billions will be enough and whether they will transform the Ukraine in the right direction. Oh, Thank you. That's a great question. I'm looking forward to the answer. And the third question here. Alan Cook from the British Embassy. Um, sanctions are going to be discussed again very soon and against Russia. Should we be um, pushing for harder sanctions against Russia, given their behavior in the Ukraine crisis? Alan, I'm really, we were going, uh, 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 I'm glad you brought up Russia because this brings us into the next phase of the, of the discussion. Let's deal with the, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement first. Um, who wants to? Yes, yeah. Neil. And yeah, just uh, on, 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 on the delayed implementation of the Ukrainian uh, deep and comprehensive free trade area, uh, we on the, on the EU side have been open and, and are open for consultations in explaining the implications uh, as, they, as they may uh, concern uh, Russia. But what we're, what we're not uh, open to is a, a review of the contents of the uh, of the bilateral <laughs> agreement that we have with uh, with another uh, with another country. Now, the the, the timeline, obviously, uh, if we look at the timeline, that that is at the end of uh, at the end of this year. So, uh, I'm uh, I, I don't I don't think we should really take it in the context of. Uh, of Riga, whereas of course it is an element for you know the, the relationship that, that I understand. No, excuse me. I mean, Russia Russia created a huge fuss over the, over the implementation of this agreement, and the EU it depends on which who who actually which side you're on, frankly. But actually, the EU didn't implement this. Was this a was this a bad decision postponing it? What signal did that send to the to the Ukrainians? Well, that decision was taken, of course, in consultation with uh, with Ukrainians. Uh, and one of the ministers resigned as a result. <laughs> okay, second question. Uh, IMF, um, I, you, now you can tell us about the internal discussions <laughs> about <laughs> this. So I suppose i better take this question. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, the, you're, you're referring to the discussions with negotiations we were having with the previous government in, in 2013. Um, I don't know if there was a number ever, ever put on them. Um, the number now, by the way, the 40 billion you refer to, that's a total package, including all the different financing sources, including uh, debt relief, um, not all of that is coming from the IMF. Um, you know, we've, we, um, we really have been taking a sort of non-political approach to this. We were very ready to um, support the previous government if they were ready to do the reforms. You know, we've learned plenty of times in plenty of countries that if you uh, lend money uh, against and, and the reforms aren't done, you don't achieve anything. You know, the program would very quickly have run into the sand, which is in indeed the experience we've, we've had with, with uh, Ukraine a number of times in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had an agreement that we could believe in that was going to make the situation sustainable. We weren't able at that time to reach agreement on those, those objectives. There were differences with, with the government on energy policy, on fiscal policy, on exchange rate policy, uh, you name it. Um, and those are essentially the same policies that we've been pursuing now with the new government. The new government is ready to, uh, is, is ready to pursue them. We would have been happy to go ahead with the old government as well. We were in, in good faith negotiations with them, but we weren't able to reach agreement. And I don't think it would have helped anybody for us to paper over the cracks and pretend that we had an agreement when, when we didn't, if, if that's really the question. And maybe Medan <coughs> mightn't have wanted it either, actually, because they wanted to really push for the reforms. The Russia issue, um, which is quite difficult because, because the sanctions were for one particular issue. Should, should, not, should tougher sanctions perhaps be imposed? Should the current ones be renewed and should it be tougher sanctions? Gwen and uh, Werner, would you like to answer too, uh, Gwen? Yeah? In response to your questions, I think it is um, quite likely that sanctions will be extended. I'm not entirely sure there is agreement within the EU on, on toughening sanctions, but in the absence of any other feasible uh, means of doing something, um, I think that's, that's, it's likely that it will at least be somewhat extended, but um, how far, we don't know yet. Um, it's also not entirely clear what effect the sanctions are having so far. I think there's a reasonable amount of, of um, discussion about this, uh, what the effects really are on the, on the Russian economy, but it's clear it will only ever be medium or more long-term effects anyway. And the history of sanctions shows us that sanctions 
are most effective when they're combined also with diplomacy and political engagement. And that brings it back to your earlier question about what the EU needs to do. And I think although it might be um, inconvenient to think about this, uh, this might be the time when the EU has to start um, opening up formal discussions with something like the um, Eurasian Economic Union. The EU doesn't have much to lose from it. It's not clear where that project exactly will go, but as it's at the beginning, um, let's not make another mistake of not using an opportunity for at least dialogue. Oh, no. No, very much on similar lines. Let's say on, on 6 March last year, the, the heads of state and government decided on a, on a, on a mechanism that the, eventually took place in, in several steps to, to go forwards according to developments on the ground that we saw how un, 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 unfelicitous these, these very developments were. Now we have in this Minsk II arrangement a certain calendar we can now calibrate whether the, uh, analyze whether, whether all the, uh, the two parties have been let's say, contributing what they are supposed to contribute at certain dates. Uh, there is definitely a big homework for the Ukrainian government on, on, on doing so constitutional reform, doing yeah. so the extending uh, decentralization, which is not a process for two weeks' time, and particularly not under such, such political circumstances. And definitely, and I think there is a couple of EU statements now on, 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 on uh, as a state and government different. level and also ministers, for ministers' level, uh, exactly what Gwendolyn was saying. I said, well, should be nevertheless, in the, in also for the sake of diplomacy and, and political tools, uh, go, go and, and, and look what is what is in the box in, in, in talking with the Eurasian Union, particularly in the, coming back to Mr. Public's question, if there had been this delay on, on implementation on the on the question, is there, and, and I understand from my Brussels sources that there was hardly any situation where people got the impression that the Russians can really prove that the allegations of the detrimental effect of the DCFDA were, 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 could, could be proved black and white on, or in, in writing or on paper. And, and, and insofar, maybe a, a political approach to something which is then political talks uh, might be useful. But we're getting into a quite complicated juxtaposition here, extending the sanctions, dialogue. The position in the EAS, remember when um, uh, High Rep Mogherini delivered this paper, uh, presented a, a paper, whatever color it was, <laughs> presented a paper about Russia and then, you know, it was criticized, some praises, some criticized it. What's the sentiment now in, in Brussels? Um, can you tell us? I think, I, th I, th I think a lot of things need to happen on the, on the part of Russia for, uh, uh, for the EU to be, uh, to be able to uh, move forward in our, uh, you know, with, uh, with our uh, relations. The full, full implementation of uh, Minsk uh, agreements, uh, for one. Um, then um, uh, we've seen um, uh, we've seen uh, a number of protectionist measures vis-à-vis -vis Russian neighboring countries contradicting the WTO obligations. Well, in a more in a more general sense, the the whole issue of uh, adhering to the international norms uh, and principles as far as the uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity issues are uh, are concerned. Um, without uh, w without uh, um, change of tack on 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 these issues, it's very difficult to um, um, to ha you know, to, for the EU to uh, to have a, a more sort of uh, forthcoming. I know you're not in Brussels approach. at the moment, but does the assassination of Boris Nemtsov uh, change issues? I mean, this is <laughs> this is quite uh, traumatic. Mm. Well, it yeah. suggests, if nothing else, it suggests that there, there might be again more civil society there than we think. Um, Indeed, yes. That kind of civil society. <laughs> No, civil society in terms of what we've seen in, in terms of the demonstrations. Yeah, yesterday. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we must the, never... A quick question then, two questions. Yes? Now, on the sanctions. Sanctions are always bad. They are bad for everybody. But if you don't want to go to war, that's the only instrument you have. So I think Russia knows perfectly what it has to do for these sanctions to disappear, for new sanctions not to step in. And I am sorry when the Europeans send there to negotiate Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Hollande, they are not send it, sending a young uh, diplomat from, I don't know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia of, or Estonia. So if now Russia doesn't know what it has to do to get rid of these sanctions, I don't know what we should do. But the, the, the point with Russia right now, Russia, Russia in, my, in my mind has changed dramatically last year. 
And the change for me is Putin's speech on the 18th of March in front of the Federal Assembly when he annexed uh, Crimea. Putin, till that point, in my view, was a, a not a crack, but rather open-minded and rather pragmatic. That day, he became ideologized. He put forward an ideology called the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, which is basically dangerous for all the direct neighbors of Russia, but which is also dangerous for Russia itself, because Russia is a pattern of different nations and people. And this mm. is the first time in all the history of Russia that the leader of Russia speaks about the Russian world. The Tsars never did, never did that. The Soviets, of course, not. They were the proletarians, mm. right? And this will make all discussions with Russia right now extremely difficult because the EU is pragmatic. Putin used to be pragmatic and assertive. Mm. Now he's not assertive anymore, like uh, mm. Minister Kuz has said before. He is aggressive. A country that occupies part of the territory of its neighbors is not an assertive country. I think Mr. Renzi is assertive, but Mr. Putin is aggressive. And so we cannot be in a situation when the EU will be all the time responding to this aggressivity. The EU now has to take the lead on the continent to put clear benchmarks and say, this will be like this in the power we have or then other things come down. Well, I think that's the only way to avoid mo bigger problems in the future. Well, uh, um, maybe that's why Riga should be more important. We've got a question here and a question from Jan Tegel. Please. Andrea Hofer from the Österreichische Nationalbank. I would like to put forward a more economic than political question. Yeah. Um, you said uh, before, or we heard, that uh, the EU is in competition with the Eurasian Economic Union. I wouldn't see it like that. I would propose to look a bit um, to Europe. We've still got the European Free Trade Association Agreement and we still have the U e European Economic Area. Wouldn't that be possible ways how to cooperate the Euro European Union with the Eurasian Union? Okay, thank you very much. Jan, this is Jan Tekel. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I, yeah, it's me again, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> by establishing frozen conflicts in four out of the six Eastern Partnership countries, in Azerbaijan, in Georgia, in Moldova, and now in Ukraine, the Kremlin has turned itself into a veto power player in these countries. It has, is, is effectively, it has curbed or limited the sovereignty of these nations to decide where they want to go. If they go too far, can be escalated, and their freedom to decide, you know, will be, will be limited by force. Now, in light of Russia being a veto player in four of our six partners, how much of a transformative agenda can we actually still have? And to what should we aspire in the region? Great, two great questions. Uh, we can Glenn, start on that one. <coughs> and Bernard, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's very important. And maybe, maybe it was always um, unrealistic to assume that you could be transformative beyond um, the accession area. Um, so I think maybe um, the EU and all of us inside it got carried away with this idea that the, what seemed to be democracy promotion and, and, and consolidation uh, by the EU is really very narrowly about um, joining the club and about countries that had done a lot of uh, reforms before the EU really started that, that process. So maybe this idea of transformative power never really fit um, kind of the, the ENP anyway, and this is very obvious now. And I think it gets us back to the beginning of our discussion um, and, and what I was trying to say that I think having, having more realistic, smaller goals, maybe they look smaller, but cooperation on a number of issues, also taking um, the EU's role in these conflicts more seriously. Uh, the EU um, and the ENP was not set up to address them, but increasingly they became more of a part in them. But a lot of the um, component parts don't really, I think, fit very well there. So for example, that, that issue has to become more, more prominent. Um, but it also spells the end of, I think, talking about it as a transformative power overall. But if, the, but this is the, is, if this is the case, then, these frozen conflicts and the veto that Jan talks about suggests that actually the EU's role for maneuver and influence is, it comes up literally against a brick wall. It does on, on the issue of which I think has to be, somehow this is difficult for us to kind of think in different kind of spheres at once. But if we can't solve or help to resolve these conflicts in the 
short one, what's the alternative to, to build to the rest of the countries, make them so attractive that maybe that becomes as a, a part of a domestic political dynamic, which adds kind of an effect again on the conflict. But there's no alternative, I think. Jan, do you want to pick up on this? No. Can One, can the I question, can yes, I and I want, this feeds into the Euro-Asian question. Yes, go ahead, Niels, please. No, just, just, just to add one thought. Um, I mean, that it, 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 it may be in the interests of, of partner countries, even if they face the frozen con conflict situations, to be more resilient, sort of more stronger in face of, in face of the challenges that they that we've seen sort of lately, internal or, or, or whatever the nature may be. And, and there's your, in a way, there, it, it is part of the transformative agenda. You know, good governance, I mean, democracy or, or, or whether you put it on forefront, but you know, good governance, effective public administration, anti-corruption program. I mean, all of, all of that uh, would assist the partner countries to become um, stronger in terms of their in terms of their sta uh, statehood i mean not that it would offer the solution to the frozen frozen conflicts but it would, would it would increase their resilience in the face of the of the of the volatility they may fa uh, they may uh, experience I, yes well can i quote in this ministry a prominent former Secretary of State of Austria. He's, he's sitting here, so I hope he will not strangle me afterwards. <laughs> but I heard Stefan Lenne once in Brussels say something very concrete and pragmatic about Ukraine. It was a public conference, so I'm not betraying any drinking secret here. <laughs> he, he, said, uh, he said, well, on Ukraine, it's very simple. We have one partner of the EU deeply committed to Ukraine's success. And we have another partner, Russia, deeply committed to its failure, at least to this government's failure. So when you have a situation like this in your mind, who will win? Steve Pichway, um, you're going Did with I this discussion. Um, you wanted to say something? I was wondering... I, I, yes, I want to bring up yeah. this. Um, the the, the EU-Euro-Asia question is very important because if you talk to some Belarusians about this, they say that if you open up a formal discussion between the EU and Eurasia, you've already put Belarusia into that camp and they don't want this. Sorry, please no, go I, ahead. I was just going to say yes. that, um, you know, from an economic point of view, I don't think there should be a conflict necessarily between these things. I think, you know, you need a lawyer to look at the, the individual uh, treaties that have been agreed. But I, I just wanted to make one point that, that Russia is already in the WTO and that's already an issue uh, actually for Belarus and uh, for other countries. So these, these sort of things, you know, happen and usually there can be a way to, 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 make them, to make them work, I think. But uh, uh, it depends on goodwill, I think, on, on both sides. Can, can yes, one yes of course. Um, from, from the EU side, we, uh, we do not see uh, a membership in the Eurasian Economic Union as an obstacle for a, a sort of a, a solid and, and close cooperation. Um, it, maybe not as far as the economic integration would go, but in, not an obstacle for a, for a, for a, for a close cooperation. Um, two, of, two of our uh, six uh, Eastern partners are uh, the members of the Eurasian, Econ uh, Eurasian Economic Union, so we need to see with them, uh, you know, the scope of, uh, of, of the cooperation that, that that may have, which will not uh, which will not go as far as the association uh, ag ag agreements, but it could still be substantial, a uh, substantial one, and 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 uh, you know, for for example's sake, from a from a different uh, region, we we've, we've been discussing with. Uh, with Kazakhstan, who is also a member of the Eurasian Economic uh, Union, uh, a, a new agreement uh, that, we, uh, that we would have with this country, a substantive uh, agreement. So on our part, there is, uh, you know, we don't see uh, um, um, uh, these, these uh, as mutually exclusive uh, uh, possibilities. Can I add yes. something on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is very important, and Werner has underlined that before, that not to brush away Russia's concerns when it comes to economics. 
and I think in 2013 we did it a little bit. Okay, they were invited, they didn't want to come to the discussions, but still there were consequences, economic consequences for Russia that we did not take into account. And second, what was said on having direct relationship with the Eurasian Union, and okay, we're not discussing NATO here, but I would say NATO with the CSTO. Yes, come on, why not? When we refuse that, in my views, we prove to the Russian that we also are still in a mindset of the Cold War. It doesn't cost us anything to have conversation with these two organizations. Why shouldn't we? Well, nobody's saying that we're in the mindset of the Cold War. So they say that all the time. If you, if you watch Russian TV, it's worse than that. Uh, you know? Russian TV is just, uh, yeah. the RT is just so sophisticated, it's beyond comment. We've got room for one last, uh, one last round of questions. Uh, one here. Yes, please. Yeah, microphone here, please, if, if you identify yourself. And then any, we've got room for two more questions if anybody wants. Uh, I'm sorry, to. one country which is member of Eastern Partnership and wasn't mentioned here is Azerbaijan. I would like to hear your views regarding the future <laughs> relations between Azerbaijan and the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've just got room for two more questions. Oh, yes. No? No? Okay. Let, can we take the... Uh, yes? No? Go ahead. It's, a second question is allowed since you nodded to the first one. I would like to ask whether we are not observing right now uh, kind of a two waves of um, Eastern Partnership. We have three, focus, I mean, really three countries that signed association agreements. And then, of course, Azerbaijan, um, Belarus, and I mean, also three countries, which, and Armenia, yes. which is now, jo which will be probably joining the Eurasian Economic Union. So I would like to ask whether this is kind of a two waves of now Eastern Partnership and whether we should not stop with this tree. I mean, if we are about idealizing, why should we not, I mean, European Union also set up particular borders and say, these are our three European neighbors which we are going to focus on for the next, let's say, 10, 15 years. This is our geopolitical priority to the East and what, what, what is your opinion on that? So essentially it is a two-tier it is already a two-tier structure. Um, anybody like to deal with the two-tier? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, thank, th thank you for that question. In fact, it kind of links into the first question uh, as well. Uh, now, the, 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 the thing is, we, we, we would not like to see, you know, to, to sort of further, further fragment uh, our Eastern partnership in, in sort of creating sub subcategories there. I think what we're seeing, what we're seeing is that the differentiation uh, in, in practice, the three countries by, by go, um, uh, going for the association agreements have sort of differentiated uh, themselves, but that should not make the other three, uh, we, f we have to find a way uh, where it doesn't make the other three feel a sort of, of, of a lesser, of a lesser significance. So, so, so the thing is, also, the, the, the other three countries have to have to have to have a certain niche in the partnership that corresponds to what they expect. Now, the Azer Azerbaijan uh, expectations are very uh, very limited, and, and of course, it is it is a challenge for us, uh, which we are trying to to uh, discuss with uh, with Azerbaijan is how can we construct relationship where the ambition is uh, is, is of course there is the energy. Uh, the, the energy issue, but uh, but uh, there are a certain certain fundamentals for for the European Union as well that uh, I, I think the commissioner uh, mentioned, uh, like uh, like the fundamental uh, rights and fundamental values. So so it's not an easy situation how to how to construct so, uh, something out of uh, out of a very few. Absolutely, chips. and at the issue then comes in the since we need energy, but what happens to our values given the whole uh, crackdown on human rights activists at the moment in Azerbaijan? Verne, you wanted to say something, and then Gwen. Yeah, very much along these lines, the, the uh, a bit more that this differentiation is this focus, this is ownership of these very countries, and so on. So this means, of course, that we we need a bit more of tailor-made approach. But this could still mean some collaboration, maybe on some, so to say, boring technical t issues, but which could be, I don't know, from from, from energy grids down to uh, not exactly human rights, because this would be clearly a highly politicized and, and political topic with the country, uh, Azerbaijan, that you just mentioned. But there, there should be more in the box, and I think this is the hope for Riga. It's quite interesting what you say about the human rights, uh, Gwen. 
Yeah, um, just gives me the opportunity actually of mentioning Azerbaijan to come back to this, this term, the neighbors of the neighbors, that seems to oh, be yes. catching on, mm -hmm. which I think is actually language I think matters in all of this as well. And that seems um, like the latest, um, perhaps unhelpful way of, of framing who we're talking about. It seems to be code for Russia. But then if we think um, of countries like Azerbaijan, possibly Armenia, it geographically, politically, culturally makes no sense to have these. These are all neighbors of some kind. And we need to think about the issues and, and links they can have with the EU and Azerbaijan can have certain links, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, they can all have others. So I think the differentiation is a, is a fact already. So for ENP or the partnership to pretend that it's, it's still kind of possible within that policy framework, I think um, obscures opportunities rather than kind of help it. That's a really good point and it brings us, it, it wraps us around actually to the first session where Mark Perini was, was pleading and our, our, our Austrian colleague, uh, our Turkish expert, about involving Turkey who's our neighbour, and the neighbours of Turkey, which are just so important for this area of, of Europe. This ends our discussion, and we have uh, Stefan Lehne and his colleague uh, wrapping up this. Thank you very much for... Uh, uh, should we book our tickets for Riga? Should we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> we'll book our tickets for Riga. Okay, thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, dear <laughs>
other actors out there, very powerful actors, who have a lot of influence and have a completely different agenda. And we, I think in the East, this is, I think, the last person on the world <laughs> has to recognize that this is the case now. Uh, so the notion of simply sort of exporting our model to the neighborhood uh, was not a, re a realistic uh, notion. And of course, if we don't export stability and prosperity, we import instability and all sorts of other problems. And I think the risk that we have now is that we uh, come into some kind of a homeland security mindset, where somehow uh, the transformative agenda is no longer practical, and we are sort of narrow down, focused again to the security agenda on illegal migration, terrorism, Islamist ex extremism, a very, very narrow focused agenda, which is definitely uh, not in the long-term interests of the European Union. Now, I've worked a lot with, uh, with, with Mattia Tisari during the Kosovo status process, and Marty would always recall uh, his own military training as an officer of the Finnish army. And he said the ground rule was, if there is a clash between the plan and reality, the plan applies. <laughs> and I think for a long time, this was also a little bit the mindset of the European Union. So I think over the years, we uh, noticed things that were not developing really as we wanted them to develop. But uh, in a way, it was simpler simply to continue as before. Therefore, we reviewed the neighborhood policy in 2011, and then we continued pretty much as before. I think no real adjustment that was on the level of the real change in our environment uh, took place. Now, I think this is very commendable. Uh, President Juncker has recognized uh, that the so the gap between the plan and the reality is now so big, so huge, that we actually have to uh, adjust the plan to the reality. Uh, and I, I think uh, listening to, to, to Commissioner Hahn, but also to the discussions here, it seems to me that the basic principles of this review are not terribly controversial. I think the fundamental ideas are very similar. They recur again and again. One fundamental point is, of course, differentiation. We understand that the uh, neighborhood policy as an overarching framework of instruments and policies and programs that can be applied throughout the region is dead. It's fundamentally dead. And I think the focus must be to develop a toolbox that can uh, really support multiple neighborhood policies, tailor-made according to the wishes of our partners and the interests of the European Union. Uh, of course, if you drive the differentiation far enough, you end up with foreign policy, you know, coming from the foreign ministry. For me, that's not tragic. <laughs> but I think <laughs> there are other players out there who don't like this idea, idea too much. Uh, a second basic principle that everybody agrees on is flexibility. I think uh, by its very nature, many of the neighborhood policy instruments uh, have only a chance to, if they're applied in a long-term perspective in a basically stable environment. And there is no stable environment, and for that reason, um, some of these things that were done have lost relevance, and there is a need to have also instruments that can react, respond much more rapidly to changing uh, circumstances. A third point is, and everybody agrees to this basically, uh, that this bureau-technocratic image of the neighborhood policy uh, needs to change. I think that there has to be a much more political process. And for that, I think we have now in the Commission a much better setup. Uh, Federica Mogherini is chairing the, very actively the RELIX group of commissioners. It will be much easier now, I think it should be much easier, to relate uh, the, the ENP instruments uh, to the foreign policy instruments to integrate these various approaches in a better overall foreign policy of the European Union. Uh, I think equally important, and that's part of the same point, is to bring the member states on board. I think this kind of, uh, somebody mentioned it, this no function of the neighborhood policy as a smokescreen behind which the member states run their own business-focused policies and the values, promotion of values, democracy somehow outsourced to the European Union is totally counterproductive, because our partners see through that bluff and don't take it seriously. So uh, you need uh, the member states really strongly engaged uh, 
in, in conceiving uh, the new neighborhood policy, but also in, in, in the programming, in, in, in the implementation. I think there are notions like trust funds or joint programming that can be very useful in, in getting the member states more involved in the policy. Uh, then I would also say that uh, I think the, the conditionality concept has to be resolved. We had this more for more idea that if a country reforms more, it should get more benefits and less. In the abstract, it makes a lot of sense. In reality, uh, it is very difficult to handle in a correct way because clearly uh, with some countries, uh, failing states, which are at huge risk of, of completely collapsing, there is a huge need to do much, much, much more, even if you see less and less and less in terms of reform. So I think conditionality can work with a few countries that are really committed to getting as close to the EU and who want really an integration perspective in the broader sense of the word. But it cannot be used by, with countries that don't buy into this agenda and into this perspective. And with these countries, you have to have a much more transactional relationship. You, they want certain things from the EU, we want certain things from them. This is done in the traditional way in which foreign policy has been, has been handled uh, in many years. Uh, and I, I also believe that the regional dimension of, of neighborhood policy has to be reinforced. Uh, many of the problems of these uh, countries in the east and in the south are really regional problems. Uh, in the south you have a huge deficit, and this was mentioned, of, of in joint infrastructure, of cooperation structures. The EU is a model of regional cooperation, and we have not been able, and it's extremely difficult, uh, but we have not been able to turn this into one of the main pillars of the neighborhood policy. Now, my worry about it, and I don't want to sound cynical, but I, on the basis of these principles, it shouldn't be too hard to, to come up with a very good paper in the autumn. So uh, I think the basic conception is already there, uh, and there are extremely clever people working on this issue, so I'm looking forward to a really excellent super paper. The question is, will anything really change. I think there's a huge risk that the fundamental problem of a lack of political will of member states and institutions to really get their act together and actually have a common foreign policy uh, w based on uh, solid <laughs> instruments and resources and with a lot of focus and, and with a political driving force that cannot be outsourced to the big countries. Uh, there, I think, there are big questions open. And that, but the problem is now where the EU, for the first time in its history, is in a geopolitical competition with a very powerful outside actor. It is involved in, in a acute crisis where it's a party. It's not a, a bystander. It's not promoting stability. It is directly engaged. And in the South, you are confronted with a series of c catastrophes. Uh, failing states, uh, huge humanitarian disasters, uh, where uh, the EU's interests are extremely at stake, and we are confronted with the consequences if we fail. So, if not now, when? <laughs> if that is the big question. But this is the fundamental issue. We can have the most beautiful neighborhood policy unless something happens in the mindset of the key people in the member states and in the institutions in actually getting the act together and, and working in a much, much more focused and, and a stronger way, uh, I'm not very optimistic. But Jan is. <laughs> Um, well, it is always difficult to, to conclude evermore after Stefan Lehne. Um, it, is, uh, it, it borders the impossible. But let me pick up a couple of things I, I take from you, Stefan, and also from, from the audience today. And uh, I, th I thank you all very much for this rich discussion we had. Uh, it was the idea that, that this was our initial input into this EMP review process. Um, a lot of member states put forward papers, either individually or in groups of papers, um, put together by, by, by humble uh, um, bureaucrats uh, in, in our offices and foreign ministries. But we wanted to have a richer debate and, and, and feed that in at the beginning of what is uh, a process. We're just at the beginning. Um, and I came out of this discussion today with actually more questions than answers, but that, that's, I think, uh, healthy, especially at the beginning 
uh, of a process. I mean, a lot of questions, especially in the, in the, in the, in the second panel, uh, also from the audience, were, were actually very detailed questions on facts, uh, on individual uh, problems. So, but how do we translate that? How do we distill it out to, to feed in properly into the, a new concept? Uh, I think this was a challenge I, I took away uh, from, from today with me. Um, one big thing which uh, nobody challenged uh, today, uh, and we had two panels, one in the south, one in the east, is uh, are we continuing our myths? One myth is the whole neighborhood should be treated equally, the south and the east, uh, it's under one policy umbrella. Uh, we can just solve it maybe with differentiation and tailor-made uh, this, this dilemma, but uh, are we uh, dodging the hard questions, um, I ask myself? Uh, do we have a, a, um, a less ambitious uh, paper trying to circumvent uh, uh, the real questions? And uh, taken away from the second uh, um, panel, um, do we want to conceive uh, now the, the Eastern Partnership more as, if I uh, take Alain, rather as a weapon of confronting the Russian Federation uh, or Putinism? Or do we want to have it as something which has a longer term vision, trying to, as my minister said, avoid what was the original concept, avoiding new borders uh, in, in, in our continent or in our neighborhood, if I take uh, the broader um, area. Um, the other issue which, uh, which uh, Stefan mentioned, uh, I mean, we all agree in all the papers uh, from member states also, we have differentiation, flexibility, and so on. But how, these are nice catchwords. Um, um, these are slogans, if I want to be cynical. But how will that translate into, uh, into real uh, policy? There's a lot of talk of a toolbox. It's very amorphous for me. What is the toolbox? How do we really implement uh, this policy? Uh, how do we go from the abstract to the concrete? Uh, um, which policy mix do we, do, do we use? And, uh, and there, uh, I'm also provocative in saying, uh, will that end up uh, um, uh, in more of the same um, in the end of the day? Um, and I remember personal, uh, personally that uh, when we talked to Ukraine uh, at the very beginning of the neighbor policy, we used the very same words. Uh, our action plans are tailor-made, uh, 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 tailored to your needs. Uh, are we back to square one? Um, so uh, the, that, that is a an, an, uh, question I ask myself. Partnership, I think this is, is being, being mentioned, uh, Egyptian ambassador uh, got a part of the answer. Uh, and uh, I think this is something we, we, we are conducting here with civil society, but also with the partner states and the neighbor of the neighbors. Which brings me to, to an issue which was also maybe not so much highlighted today. Um, maybe the neighbors of the neighbors, in the sense, uh, uh, are uh, just a broader neighborhood, so we don't want to dif differentiate. But uh, um, it's not only the elephants in the room, uh, Russia or, uh, or, or the US uh, um, in, in some areas, uh, but there are more actors around. We mentioned that in the southern neighborhood, we mentioned a couple of them, and I just came across uh, 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 a number today um, where the Egyptians say we have received from the Gulf states in this 18 month uh, after post Mursi 23 billion US dollars. Um, 18 months, one country, to my knowledge, uh, the EU has for seven years 17 billion euros. Uh, how that, uh, so what does it uh, make us as a player uh, of being attractive? What is it we have uh, to offer? And then one issue ownership, which was mentioned today, where I ask myself, was, what will that translate into? Will that end up into a pick and choose game? Um, will that be a cherry picking? Does that mean that Azerbaijan can tell us um, we will discuss only about energy, but we will not discuss about human rights and, and fundamental freedoms? We also have uh, um, um, a certain uh, topics we, we want to uh, bring forward. Um, is stability now getting so much more important to us that we, we f forget about the values, even if the, uh, the commissioner uh, assured us today that we, we do not, uh, uh, but what comes first? And uh, to, to the more and more principle, I heard also today we should prioritize. Uh, okay, on what grounds do we prioritize then? So these are uh, many open questions I take away uh, with me today. Um, but, uh, but I think it was a very, uh, very valuable input 
And uh, as I said at the beginning, we're just uh, at the start of the process. And thank you very much for, for all of your uh, input today, both Carnegie Europe, all the panelists, uh, Stefan in particular, um, and also everybody here in the public. Thank you very much uh, for being here. And uh, let's hope to continue this process together to have a very good outcome where, uh, where the, both the partners and the EU will profit from it. And uh, as a, a nice token uh, for, for you, uh, there are some refreshments outside. Thank you very much for being here in Vienna. Thank you.